Uh, hello, everybody, and good afternoon. Um, John O'Sullivan is my name, and I'm secretary this year of the Civil Division of Engineers Ireland. And I am delighted this afternoon to be um, introducing this particular session because it's close to my own area of interest. Um, so this afternoon we have a, a longer event. Usually the, the Civil Division will be involved in a, a series of lectures up to about an hour uh, scheduled for the evening. Uh, but a, a number of months ago, um, Ollie came to me and we formulated something slightly different. And we had options of running four evening events to contain the same sort of material that's going to be covered uh, this afternoon. But the decision was made at that time that the format that we're going to follow this afternoon uh, was and is most suitable for the material that is being presented. So I'm delighted, as I say, to be uh, here introducing this particular session, albeit um, in a different format than what we're used to presenting here. Um, so this afternoon we're going to be looking at the Flood Studies Update Program, and it's the fifth dissemination event um, undertaken by the Office of Public Works in making this uh, portal available to practicing engineers. So the format for the afternoon is outlined on, this, on the schedule that's shown. Um, Ollie, I'm sure, will go through that in greater detail uh, when he starts. Um, there's a break that's included in it, um, and again, that will give people an opportunity maybe to discuss what's being presented. Um, so before I hand over to Ollie, there's just, I just want to highlight some of the um, housekeeping, if you like, associated to where we are, and we're delighted, of course, to be in Engineers Ireland. Uh, but most importantly, in the event of uh, the, the unlikely event of something going wrong, we have two exits. We have one on the left, and we have one on the right. And a second piece of house housekeeping I, is I'd be grateful if everybody could just ensure that their mobile phones are switched off for the duration of the session this afternoon. So without further ado, I'd be delighted just to uh, hand over to Ollie Nicholson from the Office of Public Works. Thanks very much, John. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity as well to thank John for making the, this uh, lecture or series of lectures possible. Um, what I will do is I'm going to go through just very quickly what the program is for, for today. Um, and what I would say is uh, these slides will be up on the FSU web portal uh, early next week. So um, if you don't get everything that's on them, they'll be available there for everyone to see. Um, the first half of today uh, will be just dedicated to introducing some of the basic concepts of the FSU web portal. And we'll give you an overview of the main features of the portal. And then we move on to actually getting in and using the actual portal itself. Um, so the first half of this uh, series of lectures is probably the most onerous. Um, it's a little bit easier after the break. So um, if you can maintain the most of your attention for the first half, I think you'll, you'll, you'll get much benefit out of it. So what I'll do is I'll move on and just give you a few presentations in advance, just to give you an idea of all of uh, what's there. And once we've given you those uh, presentations, we'll actually go into the portal and actually do a few um, uh, examples, worked examples. Okay, this is the, um, the home page of the website. Um, you'll be familiar with this by the end of the lectures. And um, what we're going to do now is just move on and give you an introduction to the FSU web portal data sets themselves. And I think this is needed uh, to give you a good idea of uh, where everything, all the methodologies come from and everything that was used in the flood studies update research. Um, the presentation, presentation structure, um, I'll just give you a bit of background on the flood studies update and outline the objective of the uh, FSU, as we call it for short. Um, then I'll go through um, a description, really, of the data sets that are used in the FSU methodologies which include hydrological data sets, spatial data sets, and these combined are used to derive what we call the physical catchment descriptors, the PCDs for short. And that's a term that will come up quite regularly today as well. And also then I'll just finish off by explaining really the basis of how the FSU methodologies were, were derived. Okay, just to give you the background, um, in 1975 the Flood Studies Report, the FSR, was published and that covered uh, flood estimation methodologies for both the UK and Ireland. Um, after a, a number of supplementary reports and changes to the F FSR methodologies, uh, it was realised in the UK that they needed a substantial update and that came in the form of the Flood Estimation Handbook in 1999. Now that covered only the UK 
and in Ireland we continue to use the older flood studies report um, up until around about 2004 the Irish national branch of the IHP ICID recommended that the flood studies report be updated for Ireland um, and also this was included in the OPW's report of the flood policy review group which set out that the flood studies update would be one of the work programs that the Office of Public Works would em, uh, embark on. Uh, as a result, in June of this year, in 2014, the flood studies update web portal was launched, and that covers that covers Ireland. So the objective of the FSU research is quite simple. It's to provide improved methods of extreme rainfall and flood estimation at both gauged and ungauged locations in Ireland. Um, and this is probably a theme that will run through a lot of the uh, presentations that we give you today and the demonstrations as well. There's two, I suppose, divisions here. There's the gauge locations, uh, calculating floods and rainfalls at gauge locations, but also there is uh, ungauge locations, which, pr which probably represents uh, the majority of, of uh, estimations that will be done in the web portal. Some obvious stuff here. Why was an update to the flood studies report required? Well, there was 40, the biggest one really is that there was 40 years more of data in Ireland, both rainfall and flow data. There's also a large number of advances in, in hydrological research um, with different methodologies being, um, I suppose, uh, formulated. There was also major advances in GIS. If you think of 1975, most people would never have seen a, a PC or a computer of any description. Uh, but nowadays we have ge geographical information systems which uh, brought with it major improvements in mapping of a lot of the different uh, uh, soil types, etc., in the country. And also, the internet wasn't around in 1975, so um, advances in ICT and the um, ad advent of PCs and the internet were an obvious reason why we needed to update a lot of these methodologies. And also, in that time, there's been lots of changes to catchments around the country, be it from the point of view of climate or land use changes or even um, items such as arterial drainage would have affected the way flows occur in a lot of catchments. Um, this is a, a summary that I usually show people just to explain really why, well I won't say why the FSU is better, but why we have definitely um, a larger wealth of information to draw upon. And for example, uh, in the Flood Studies Report 1975, uh, they had 3,300 years of um, rainfall information available to them from gauges all over the country. But for the flood studies update, we had near on 26,000 years of rainfall available to us. Also, um, looking at flows um, in Ireland, for the flood studies report, there was the number of stations that were available were able to, well, 112 of them were able to produce only 1,700 years of annual maximum flows, whereas for the flood studies update, we had uh, over 6,700 annual maximum flow years available to us. And much of this has um, come together really, and I suppose that's, I won't call it the magic number, but it's a good indicator of the improvements that have come with the FSU. The Factorial standard error, which was 1.5 for the older flood studies report, has now come down uh, substantially to 1.37. Okay, um, I suppose really just to set the scene, um, I want to explain to you all of the different hydrological, uh, or all the types of data sets used in the flood studies update research. Uh, the first one I will talk about are the hydrological data sets, basically everything re relating to river flows. Secondly, I'll talk about meteorological data sets and rainfall depths, etc. And then thirdly, I will move on to talking about the spatial data sets, which are uh, topographical data, land use information, all the different types of maps that are used. Um, and all of these above are used in the derivation of these physical catchment descriptors. Okay, this is probably familiar to most of you. Um, it's a trace from a gauging station. so. You can see a lot of information can be gleaned from this. Uh, you have your flows in 15 minute intervals. Um, also, you can pick out different features. You can pick out things such as an annual maximum flow from that trace. You can also pick out hydrograph shapes and, and do analysis on those. So this is one of the basic um, pieces of information that was used in the flood studies update and 
These were collected for a number of stations around the country. One important um, item that we are able to derive from the flow information that we have at all of these gauges um, is the annual maxima series. It's effectively just a list of the annual maximum flow at a particular gauge for each hydrometric or each water year. <laughs> so um, they're just tabulated in a list for one for each year uh, with a, an associated level. And one piece of information that you can actually get from that is what's called QMED, which is the median annual flow, sorry, which is the median annual flow here. Uh, if you were to sort all of the annual maximum flows um, in increasing order and pick the one in the middle, that's your median. Uh, so it's a, whereas the flood studies report would have used the Q bar, the average of all of these, the flood studies update will be using QMED, which is the median of, of the annual maximum flow series. <coughs> okay, just to show what we uh, used in the research, um, we looked at all of the gauging stations in the country. I think there was well over a thousand initially to start with, um, and that was whittled down um, to, I suppose, exclude some of the tidal gauges, some of the poorer quality gauges. So we ended up with 216 gauging stations that we found were of suitable quality to be carried on and um, for the FSE research. And so you can see the spatial coverage of the gauging stations around the country. There's a few spots where it's probably a little bit sparse, maybe down around Kerry, maybe parts of Donegal, I think, and some parts of Mayo. But as a general, generally now, we have a, a fairly good coverage all over the country. And just to draw your attention to the uh, different classifications over here, um, we looked at the highest gauged flow at each gauge, so the highest or the largest spot gauging that was, was achieved at each gauge, and we used that as a sort of a marker to indicate how well a lot of these gauges measure the larger and higher flows. Um, and you'll see the classification there where the highest gauge flow uh, in relation to QMED was greater than 1.3, it was given an A1 classification. Now there were, there were a few other provisos there, but that's the kind of, you know, overarching rule that we used. Similarly, um, the next level was the A2 station, so if your highest gauge flow ratio uh, in relation to QMED was between 1 and 1.3, it was given an A2 classification, and so on. Same for B station, just a slightly similar or slightly different rule. And then anything worse than that were C stations are unusable. They were just thrown out. So um, with the result that we had the 216 stations, and uh, another thing just to draw your attention to, you'll see there's triangles here on the actual plot of the, uh, the country. Um, the colors of the triangles correspond to the classifications, but another piece of information that was used in, in the FSU report was that uh, the period of record at each of these gauges is represented by the size of the triangles. So the, the larger the triangle, the longer the period of record. Okay, um, moving on, that was the hydrological data sets. Now we'll move on to the spatial data sets. And the, I suppose the five main data sets that we used were the Ordnance Survey Digital Elevation Model, uh, the contour map of the country effectively, the EPA Blue Line River Network, the FSU node and FSU station locations were then applied to the river network. And from that we were able to derive gauged and ungauged catchment outlines once you have those outlines, you can go and derive physical catchment descriptors for each of those um, for each of those catchments. Okay, so how did we build up the data sets in the FSU? Well, we started off with the Ordnance Survey digital elevation model, which is ba it's based on a 10 meter grid with a vertical accuracy of plus or minus two meters, and most people will be familiar with this kind of a map. It's a, it's effectively a contoured map of the country, uh, but it was the the starting point for how we developed all the uh, physical catchment descriptors. And once we had that di digital elevation model, we were able to burn the, what's called, what we're calling the EPA Blue Line River Network. It was originally developed by the Ordnance Survey about maybe 15 or more years ago. And that's all it was. It was literally a, a set of blue lines that represented rivers. And then just prior to the beginning of the Water Framework Directive work, the EPA took the OSI mapping and filled a lot of the gaps and more importantly in, in a GIS format they put in flow directional lines so you could actually show directions of the flow with uh, each of these rivers. 
So that's your blue line river network. The next step we took was to apply what we're calling the FSU nodes, or just nodes for short. Um, each node is placed at about, well, yeah, there are little bits of a tweak to the rule, but effectively they're spaced at 500 meter centers. And each of these nodes are used then for performing each of your calculations. And you'll see here that each node has its own unique label. So uh, you'll see here 22, that represents the hydrometric area uh, within which the um, node is. Uh, each river segment has its own number within each hydr hydrometric area. So uh, you'll see the point that um, the red arrow is, is pointing at there. Um, in this example, it's on river segment 3419, and it's the second node down that river segment. So that's why the underscore two is there at the end. Once you have all of these nodes set out along, around the country, we then use the digital elevation model to derive the catchment outlines that correspond to all of these as well. So you can see here, this is a, a well, the point that I used in the last slide, this is just to, uh, just to show the, the next stage in the development, which was to derive the catchment outline using the digital elevation model. So you basically follow along the, the higher points from that point. Um, just while I'm on this topic, just to say that there is about 134,000 of these nodes in the country. So it was a fair body of work to actually get all of these derived even though it was done in an automated process, it, it was still a sizable amount of work to just run this. Um, but once you have your catchment outline, you can use it like um, a cake cutter, I think is the analogy that's often used. So you can lay it on top of other data sets, spatial data sets or maps, and you can derive a lot of information about the types of soils that were in the catchment, the land uses, etc., cetera, the, the number of river segments. And so once you have that outline, as I say, you can overlay it and, and it's almost like cake cutting or clipping as people often call it. So I'll move on to describe what these physical catchment descriptors actually are. Um, in its simplest form, you can see a physical catchment descriptor derives, derives the characteristics of a catchment in a numerical form. So it's just a number. Um, the first and most obvious one that you'll see is the catchment area. The second one is the standard period average annual rainfall. That's the average annual rainfall over a 30-year period. So it's an indicator of a catchment wetness. The third one there is the base flow index derived from soils. And this is a, uh, those of you familiar with the flood studies report would have used soil types one, two, three, four, five, etc. This is, I suppose, a replacement of that data set. So, so um, it's information that we've gleaned from soils, so it indicates the uh, permeability of a catchment. Um, those first three will probably show up most regularly uh, in today's talks because they're the most important descriptors that describe flow in a catchment. Now, there are other very important ones as well, such as the flood attenuation from reservoirs and lakes. That's another catchment descriptor that describes how um, uh, I suppose large surface water body features can attenuate flows in rivers. Drainage density is uh, a measure of how many river segments are within a catchment. The mainstream slope, I'll come on to that later, that's slope. Arterial drainage, which is also another factor in, in defining how flows are calculated, <coughs> because you will find that arterial drainage tends to increase flows um, in catchments. So that has to be included. And obviously then the proportion of the urban land cover or urbanization, which is uh, described by the catchment descriptor urbext. I'll just visually go through what all of these are. So this one doesn't need an awful lot of explanation. We are given the area of a catchment for a particular node and the units of that are in kilometers squared. What we do then is we can take the annual average rainfall on its, I think it's a two kilometer grid. Um, and then we average the SAR value across the whole catchment. So we get a representative value of the annual average rainfall for the catchment as a whole, and that's in millimetres per year. Uh, I spoke about the soil descriptor, which is base flow index, BFI soil. Um, it's the base flow index derived from soils. Uh, we took the aquifer maps, the subsoil maps, and the soil maps for the country, and using a, a few bits of different types of analysis, uh, we came up with a way of relating the measured BFI at gauge locations. Uh, by, uh, we could, sorry, 
we were able to relate the measured BFI at gauge locations uh, to the soil types, the constituents to soil types within some of those catchments. So for each of those nodes, we were able to derive this BFI factor. Flood attenuation from reservoirs and lakes. This is quite an important factor because, um, as we've witnessed, a lot of um, lakes or large surface water bodies within a catchment can have a, a quite a large attenuating effect on some of the design flows. So um, it's, it's a roundabout way of just describing how many lakes or the proportion of lakes within the catchment. Um, and what it does is in, it indicates the attenuating effects of these, these large lakes or large water bodies. And it has a range of between 0 and 1. So if you have a feral value of 1 at, for a catchment, that's a sign that, are, that means effectively that there are no lakes in the catchment. Whereas if you have a low value of feral, um, 0.6 would be quite low. Anything below that is, I would say, very low. So if you have anything less than 0.6 6 or around about 0.6, it shows that there's extensive lake coverage in the catchment. The next descriptor is well, quite simple. Um, it's the drainage density. It relates the, the overall length of river segments within a catchment to the catchment area. So it's, a, it's, it's an indicator of the density of, of streams within a catchment. The next one is the mainstream slope. Obviously, slope will affect flows. Um, what is the normal practice is to take away the upper 15% of the actual river and the lower 10% and discard them. So it gives you a more representative idea of what the overall slope of the catchment is. Um, and the units for that are in metres per kilometre. Um, arterial drainage. Um, once again, it's a proportion. It's the proportion of the upstream river network that has been included in drainage schemes, and the units of that are in kilometres per kilometres. Um, once again, because it's a proportion, it's between zero and one. The last one I think on the list here is the proportion of urban land cover extent. And again, it's another proportion. So it was based on the Korean land cover data set. And we use that to derive what the percentage of urban extent or urban coverage was within the catchments. And again, it's between zero and one. So I'll just come to the end of this presentation just to give you a, a, a really a just an overview of, of you know, how you come to describe or derive all of these uh, flood variables that, you, you know, if you want to get a design flood, how you derive them for ungaged locations. So the way we would do it is, well, first of all, you need to define what your variable of interest is. So we'll take the example of QMET, the median flow or the median annual maximum flow. Um, you collect up measured values of that variable for all the gauge locations that you have. And also what you do then is you derive all the physical catchment descriptors for those gauge locations. And once you have those two, I suppose, uh, pieces of information, once you have the measured value of QMED, and once you have your physical catchment descriptors, you can then develop a relationship between the two. So. When I say develop a relationship between the two, pretty much I mean you just can develop an equation. Um, and once you have that equation developed based on all your information from gauge locations, uh, you've got a generalized method for estimating, for estimating these uh, flood variables at ungaged catchments or locations. Just to show you a flow chart really of how that's all built up, um, using the QMED value as, as an example. So first of all, you collect all your QMED values at gauge locations. You derive the physical catchment descriptors for those catchments. You derive the relationship between the two, which is an equation. Um, this is important to just remember, it is just an equation. Then you, what you can do is, using that equation, you can calculate your QMED value at ungaged locations. But there's a further step that has to be looked at here. And this relates to a lot of the, all of the flood variables that we look at in the FSU. And it's a concept that is um, systemic through, throughout the um, flood studies update methodologies, where you use other information from gauge locations to adjust the estimate, your first guess, your first guess estimate from the equations. So <coughs> we'll come on to that later, but th this is just a, I suppose, a brief introduction to this concept of what we're calling pivotal sites. So that last point is very important. Um, Using equations, you're, you're only blindly relying on what catchment descriptors are giving you. 
but the important step is that last one there, that you use gauged information or observed information from other gauges to adjust your equation estimate to bring it back to uh, some sort of reality. Okay, so that's that one. What we'll do is we've one or two presentations. I'll try not to bore you to death with presentations, but we'll just, uh, it's just good maybe to introduce some of these concepts and then we'll get into the actual web portal itself and um, start, I suppose, showing you how it works. So what I'll do is I'll hand over to Fasil, who's going to give you um, just a brief overview of the main features of the FSU web portal. Um, hello again, everybody. Um, when the FSU was envisioned, when the FSU program was um, planned, it was intended that at the end, the research outputs would be um, somehow accessible to the public, so, um, so that the public or the practitioners like yourself would interact with the research outcomes and also with the FSU web portal itself. So um, I will just introduce you to the main features of the F Lab Studies Update Program web portal. Um, so um, we will see each one of uh, the ones listed on the screen. We will see registration, uh, how you manage your account, account once you are set up, the home page. I will introduce you also to the news page, document page, and so on. I'll just go straight to the uh, main components. So for a user, a practitioner, in order to use the FSU web portal, um, needs to be registered, needs to create an account. So you have to set up your username and password. And then you have to confirm that you accepted the disclaimer. So once you are done, then you can access the web portal. Um, once you have created an account, you can click the Manage My Account tab, and then you have also an, a facility where you can modify sales being held by the FSU web portal for you. You can modify your username and, and so on. Um, the next one is the home page. Um, this is the main access point to the um, practitioners. It, it contains several links, instructions how to kickstart using the applications, um, and also the background information, what led to the development of the FSU program. Uh, it will also show you, if you are interested, who the researchers were uh, behind the FSU program. Some of them are here today. Um, and also, um, moving, moving on, um, it has a news page. This is a page where news information will be displayed to the user community, um, including re release of new data, um, release of new reports, and also if we happen to, to do some modification to the methodology, some improvements, they will be um, communicated to the user using the news page. And next one is the documents page. And this is the page where uh, the user can access and download various uh, reference uh, materials relating to the FSU research and also to the development of the FSU web portal itself. Um, it includes uh, documents like disclaimer, and most impor importantly, documents like the guidance handbook, your manual to use the FSU program, the FSU web portal. It also contains, you can access uh, volumes of research outputs, the technical research reports. If you want to know in detail the methodologies behind the FSU program, you can access them freely. Um, the next page is the users form. The users forum. This is a medium where the user can discuss hydrological ideas, hydrology related topics with other practitioners. Uh, a user can raise a question, um, hydrology related issue, 
and co also contribute <coughs> contribute an idea to the discussions going on. So you can create a new topic and also contribute. It's hoped that um, this medium would facilitate discussions among the, the users. Um, the next page is the FSU help desk. Um, this is where we encourage every everybody, every user to give us some feedback that would help us to improve the methodologies. The methodologies wouldn't remain the same for the coming years. They need to be, they will need um, improvements and modifications. So that would be the facility where you give us your feedback. As the other point is, um, you could forget your password uh, and you can just send us emails using that facility to the FSU team back in OPW and we will try to get back to you as soon as we can. The next page is the frequently asked questions uh, page. Um, as in s other similar web portals, this gives <coughs> some information um, to the user in a question and answer format, um, answers to uh, general uh, questions, uh, common ideas. And it's also uh, recommended that the user go through the, this page uh, before proceeding to the analysis stage because it will give answers to the questions that may arise on the process. Um, it's a, a helpful web uh, page. Um, the other uh, page is publications and papers. Um, you can access some research uh, materials, some of them which have been published in academic journals, some of them have been published in conference uh, proceedings. So if you, if you want to do further reading, um, you can access the full paper again freely. Um, this is the application tab. Uh, up to now, the information I just mentioned, accessed without setting an account, without registration. From this stage onwards, you have to have an account, which means you have to be registered. Um, so this is the application tab. You click the, the, the button circled in red, and then you will come to the application page. This is from where um, you can download data, like the annual maximum series, or special layers um, and software and the second on the right is where the applications are the main four FSU modules you can click you can click that and you can access to those um, modules that's where you could you kick start uh, your calculations the next page is the site orientation map uh, of the hydrological modules. Um, once you are registered, you, c you come to this page and this is where you start your, your calculations. This is a key component to the FSU uh, web portal where rainfall and flood estimation <coughs> analysis are carried out. It guides the user uh, to the four modules. The Rainfall, dead duration frequency module, flood estimation module, hydrograph weeds analysis module, and EBDM. Um, it allows the user to navigate to, to the user's um, geographical lo location where the user wants to do the estimations, to do the calculations. Um, it has so many facilities, like um, you can search your site of interest by typing in either coordinate, town name, town land name, river name, river seg segment uh, code, um, and so on. Then that button will guide you to the site of interest. Um, there are also help buttons throughout the, the process, throughout the different steps where you get tips of information to guide you what you need what you have to do next. And then there is a button next one that will help you to customize the mapping background. You can change 
the mapping. There are different versions of OSI maps at the back, so you can change. Um, so it's uh, a very uh, useful, important uh, uh, fa uh, component of the FSU um, web portal, the SOM. Um, that's uh, the, 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 the facility where you change your map version. It also, the, 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 the SOM also has, throughout the process, it will have legends to explain what is what, and also you can configure the layers. You can change the layers, you can turn on and off different types, um, which we'll show you later. Um, and finally, um, when uh, you are in the applica applications doing your calculations, either you can create a new session, a new document, a new calculation, or you can open an existing one, which have started earlier. And also, it ca it, it, you can save, you, can, you give it a file name, and it will be saved. Or you can change this, the file name, and s this is a save as option. Um, the next button is the lock, which means if you are finished with your session, you just clo you c you close it, you lock it. And then the next button is where you download your flood estimation report in PDF format. In order to generate your flood estimation report, you have to close your sessions first. Um, I think um, that's, that's the main features of the FSU um, web portal. Um, I'll just lead you to the next um, presentation. Um, Um, in this presentation, um, uh, we will see in this presentation we will see the rainfall devs uh, estimation module developed by the FSU program. Um, this module allows you to estimate rainfall depths for a given frequency throughout the country of uh, Ireland. Or if you have a measured rainfall depths, it will give you what its frequency will be. So uh, the, the presentation will cover, will, I will again take you to the site orientation map and then what what is the rainfall depth duration model and also i will um, show you how the model was driven and then how the module within the fsu web portal works and then we will see live how um, that the calculation is actually uh, carried on as i mentioned the fs this this is your form this is your from where you navigate to do your uh, analysis um, these are available layers which can be turned on and off. These are your legend, legends. For every module that you are in, there will be legends and uh, layer configuration. Um, I, th I think it explains itself. So I will move on, we'll move on to the next slide. So what is a uh, dead duration frequency model? Well, it's a grid data set um, covering the whole Ireland with rainfall depths and frequency um, return period. And the durations vary between 15 minutes and 25 days. And it covers the re return periods from two years up to, uh, to 500 years. So these are the grids generated by the FSU program for rainfall depth duration frequency. So they are in grid format. They cover the whole island of Ireland. And once you click a point, it will give you those, that information. 
it gives you, for example, in the first 4.25 hour, and for different return periods, you will have the debts on the far, far left. So that's what we mean by rainfall debt duration frequency model in the FSU um, program. Um, the, the, the model developed, um, it used about 47 hourly rain gauging, uh, rain gauge stations and 577 daily stations in order to develop the rainfall uh, depth duration frequency in the FSU uh, way portal. Um, the rainfall depth duration, depth duration frequency analysis, um, in order to derive this DDF model, a max rainfall was required, the highest uh, rainfall in a year for a range of storm durations. And then once you have the, the Amax of rainfall, then a median was calculated from the observed rainfall. Uh, and then through krieging and interpolation, a grid, like I showed you earlier, was created, covering the whole Ireland. So a grid two by two kilometer of rainfall depth duration for a given uh, frequencies were created. However, due to the number of stations that I mentioned earlier, the, to, cr to create a grid, they were too sparse. So during the research, they found out that there were 946 stations used to generate annual average rainfall. And they also observed that there was a strong linear relationship between the aver average annual rainfall and the median annual uh, rainfall depth. So they created an equation to define the annual median rainfall in terms of the annual average rainfall. So they brought them together, so they arrived at a reasonable finer um, grid. And then th the next step was, uh, sorry, sorry to, to model, to, to model, um, to create a model um, to, to generate the, the depth duration frequency. And they, amongst the probability distribution, the, the log logistic probability distribution was good to fit in the, to the rainfall, observed rainfall um, depths. And from that probability distribution, um, um, a growth curve was created. And then from the growth curve, growth factors were estimated, which means we can use those growth factors as a multiplier, a multiplier to the um, median rainfall depth to give you the rainfall depth for a given return period. So you have a growth factor of a, a specific return period. You use that growth factor and multiply your median uh, rainfall depth to give to give you the frequency, it's the, the, the rainfall depth for the given return period. And then. Um, I think I covered that. The, that. That's the output from the research. That shows you a, a graded rainfall depth duration frequency, and that is a map of a five-year return period rainfall of a two-day uh, duration. As I said, um, it covers a, a very um, wide range of durations and return periods. Um, Come going back to the what? Uh, to the FSU module. All right. Uh, so. Um, 
that's the image, but behind that image, um, you have this data, as I tried to, to show you at the very beginning. Um, so if you, uh, when you go to the FSU module to do your flood um, rainfall depth duration frequency, um, that's what's behind. These are the grid points with lots of inf information uh, behind them. And you have to choose your subject of interest and then um, you, you will be able to calculate the depth duration frequency for that catchment. Um, so when you use the depth duration frequency module in the FSU, um, it's, it works two ways. You should have either the depth measured and duration. You type in that data and it will give you its frequency. Or for certain designs, you already know the return period and the duration. And the FSU, once you type in your duration and the specified return period, the, the FSU web, web portal will give you the corresponding depth. Uh, one point to, to mention while using the FSU uh, web portal is it gives you an option of using the type of duration, fixed duration, or s you have to choose either fixed or sliding uh, duration. The rainfall gauges in Ireland are set up to record 9 a.m. to 9 a.m., rainfall between 9 a.m. and 9 a.m. But in reality, the rainfall could happen in between and later. Therefore, well, if your data is a fixed, that's fine. But if you think it's it overlaps or it it's between the fixed time, then you can choose the, the sliding option, the sliding duration option. That's the purpose. Um, in the FSU uh, web module, um, once you have your um, site identified, you select if it's a point, you select a, a point, and then the FSU web portal will delineate for you uh, the catchment outlines, and then it will display um, the depth duration frequency um, grid. Um, and then it will guide you to the next step, and you have to type in either your return period and duration or your um, depth and duration and then um, it will give you the answer required. Um, one point worth mentioning um, here is the annual reduction factor. Um, this takes into account the catchment area. Um, for a large catchment area, it's, it's unrealistic to, as to assume <coughs> that the same depth, the same intensity um, of rainfall will occur um, in the entire area. So the area reduction factor will take care of that. It will um, adjust um, the rainfall violations within, within that area. Uh, that's uh, the end of my slide. So just to sum up how the depth duration frequency module was developed, uh, annual maximum rainfall depths were gathered and then the medium was found, and then a, a grid was created by intriguing and interpolation, and then log logistic probability distribution was fit to the observed data, and then the growth factor, factors were driven for different return period with which you multiply the median rainfall depth to get your rainfall depths for that uh, specific um, return period. Um, thanks, and I will pass you to the next prese presentation. Okay, thanks, Vasil. Okay, so um, I think we might as well actually show you the web portal at this stage. Um, we weren't intentionally keeping you in suspense there, it's just the way the presentations worked out. Um, so this is the, the web portal, that's the address. Now you can also access it through the 
uh, OPW uh, corporate page or the OPW homepage through the flood risk management uh, tab on the homepage. Uh, so, yep, this is your homepage. So once you've got in there, you can, and you've registered, I'll just do a login. Thank God it worked. Okay, um, yeah, as Fasil already showed you, once you click on the applications tab up here, this is what you will see. There's the download uh, application, and then there's the rainfall and flood estimation calculations. This is the one that you'll use most of the time, so um, we'll move on and go in there. Okay, now, what I'm going to do is, this is a previous piece of work we we're looking at. So up here you'll see there's the create a new file. So to create a new session, rather. So um, I'm going to just give it a name. Um, it's on the Munster Blackwater that we're going to show you. So like anything in Excel or Word or whatever, you need to create a file. You give it a file name. So then you can work on it. And, and as you go through, then you can save it. So what we're going to do is we're going to start on the rainfall depth duration frequency module here. So you just tell it. And you're automatically brought into the first tab. You'll see the tabs along here. These are all the modules that you use for your rainfall and your flood estimations. So the first one of these being the rainfall depth duration frequency module. Um, once again, the features that Fasil showed you here on the top right of the map, the search, the help, the map settings. I'll go in. It just so happens that we prepared one earlier. Um, I've chosen a fairly straight, chosen a fairly straightforward one, just just to keep the whole presentation moving along. So um, I'll just type in the node number uh, on a part of the Munster Blackwater. So once you've typed in your area or your search, the you will get a list. Now in this situation, there's only one node called 1845.2. But if you were to type in, say, for example, Dublin, you'll probably get maybe a list of, of townlands and different features with the word Dublin in it. But um, here, yeah, we've only the one, so I'll, I'll choose that. The map automatically brings you to that location. So once again, if it was if you typed in Athlone there, it would bring you to the town centre of Athlone or the city centre of it. Um, so here we go. This is the location of interest. So we, we found it by using the search item here. So on the right-hand side, you'll see there's this control panel, I suppose we can call it. And it's got a few bits of information here. Number one, it's got this on-screen stepwise guidance. That's what we call it, or OSG for short. These little blue um, help buttons, you'll see them absolutely everywhere through the portal. And they're there on purpose because we want to try and help people through each step. So some of you who would be more uh, accustomed to this kind of uh, flood estimation or rainfall estimation will know what they're doing but people who are maybe learning their way will use this quite regularly in the, the first few times they go in there um, so on the control panel it tells you in the first step what do you want to do do you want to calculate a design rainfall depth or do you want to calculate a design rainfall frequency um, I'll choose the first one here which is design rainfall depth so what the portal does is it asks you for um, some information now an example here would be, uh, I've seen some jobs where they'll specify that maybe attenuation should be good enough to take uh, a rainfall duration of maybe 24 hours uh, with a return period of, for example, 50 years. So you can do that. You type in your rainfall duration. Actually, I might just show you while we're on this topic of the on-screen stepwise guidance. If you were to click on that help button, you get, well, as I was saying earlier, on-screen stepwise guidance. Um, what it'll tell you here is please enter rainfall duration in hours that you wish to use for subsequent calculations. It tells you what you have to put in here. So if you're, if you're totally lost as to what you're meant to be entering in some of these uh, fields here on the right, it'll tell you. Now, for some of the hardcore hydrologists out there, um, and if you really have nothing else to do, you can then click into the uh, technical research report that relates to this part of the portal. So it's a further step. So for people who want to drill down a little further, you can click on that. And what the portal will do is it'll open up the technical research reports in the relevant chapter or page more so. It's in the relevant page and it tells you all of the information you need to know about what's behind all of this. So everywhere you see a blue button, pretty much you've got your on-screen stepwise guidance and then a further step you can go into this technical research report, this specific page that relates to what, what step you're at. Okay, 
So, um, yeah, back to the calculation. It asks you for your duration, so I'm saying 24 hours here, one day. Uh, the rainfall return period that we were given to calculate was 50. And we're going to do it for this catchment. It's, it's a, an upstream catchment in the Munster Blackwater. And um, as you can see, there's no gauge in that area. If there was a gauge, you'd see this triangular symbol with the green, the orange, or the red um, colouring scheme. So all these are effectively ungaged nodes. That's what they are. Um, you'll see up here, you, there's no river defined. So what you can go do is you can go into your layer configuration, and you can switch on your rivers. And you'll see it there. So what we're going to do is we're going to do it for the catchment that outfalls at this point. So yeah, location type in this situation is the ungauged catchment. And then you just click beside the node. And this is the moment where I get nervous because it takes a few seconds for it to actually open up. And you'll find that um, a lot of these layers, they're zoom sensitive. So sometimes if you're not getting any response, maybe just zoom out a little bit. Um, and then you'll get this. So once you've clicked on the node of interest, what happens is it shows you the contributing catchment to that point. So that's the catchment outline for the uh, point that has this location as its outfall. So that's the catchment outline. And you'll see back again here on the control panel, it, it shows you what the selected catchment uh, is. So it's the catchment relating to node number 18 underscore 425 underscore 2. And it tells you that its area is 245.722 square kilometers. So next step then is you can calculate. And what Fasil was talking about earlier, this aerial reduction factor. When you have an extreme rainfall, it's not going to fall uniformly everywhere on the catchment. You're not going to get the same depth of rainfall everywhere. It's going to be higher in some places, lower in other places. So in order to account for this, we include what's called this aerial reduction factor. So we get the average of all the rainfall node uh, depths throughout the catchment. And then we apply this area reduction factor, which is a, it's, it's basically the bigger the catchment, the, the, the smaller this uh, number will be, this area reduction factor. So it tells you that it applied 0.921 as the reduction factor. And your final rainfall depth for that catchment over that 24-hour period, this figure, by the way, is not millimeters per hour. This is the total for the duration that you've specified. So if that was 47 hours I specified, we would be saying here that it was 91.4 millimetres over a 47 hour period. So just be careful, that's not in millimetres per hour. So um, <clears throat> what I'll do is I'll just, yeah, if you're happy with that, you can accept the result and move on. I'll just go back and just do a, a s work it the other way. So recently there, there was a few quite we'll say large rainfall events. So what I might do is um, just say, for instance, you had a gauge um, at your office or whatever, um, or at your house, if you're into that sort of thing. And you measured um, over a 37 hour period, you measured 79 millimeters of rain. And you want to find out what's the return period of that, or what's the frequency of, of that type of a return, or of that type of rainfall. Um, you can use this, this uh, I suppose, function. So because it's 37 hours, it's not one of the standard measurements that Metairn would use from 9 o'clock to 9 o'clock, so it's 37 hours. So you'd be saying you're using a sliding duration. And we've already selected the ungauged catchment, as I showed you earlier. And once again, it shows up the node location, the area, and you can calculate. So for a rainfall depth of 79 millimetres that fell over 37 hours, it's telling you here that it's got a 12-year return period. So that's, that's it. That's, that's effectively the rainfall depth duration frequency module explained. Um, that, that's it. It's quite simple. It's straightforward. It gives you the answer without having to do any sort of messing. Um, so we can accept that result. So that's, that's, that's it done. That's the rainfall depth duration frequency module. Um, one thing I would say about this module is it's, it's independent of all the flood estimation modules that follow after it. Um, unlike the flood studies report, we don't have a design event method where you put input your design rainfall to produce different um, return period flows or hydrographs. Um, 
the flood estimation methodologies are based purely on gauge data from flow gauges, and that's it. So what I'll do is, um, we'll just, something I should draw your attention to as well. As you're going through these, it's always good practice, as with any other piece of software, just to save your session as you go along. <coughs> so just clicking on the Save Session button there. Uh, what I'll do is quickly move on. And the next step, really, that we're looking at is the flood estimation. And the first part of your flood estimation is to calculate this index flood, the basic building block of any flood estimation under the FSU approach. What is the index flood? I'll go through all of these in, our, in this presentation to explain what the index flood is, or QMED, as it's more commonly known as. Um, I'll run through the classification of FSU stations. Now, I've spoke about them our, earlier, but it's just to kind of recap on it, just to refresh your memory. And then I'll go through the FSU procedure for calculating the design flows for a specific return period. Sorry, I didn't put that into slideshow. OK, um, what is the index flood? So at a gauge location, um, I suppose put your, your mind into the frame where you're thinking of it just at a gauge. At a gauge location, it's the median of all of the annual maximum series. The figure, the number that's in the middle if you were to sort it in order, or in, in increasing order. Um, by definition, its statistical definition is that it is the two-year return period. It's not approximate, it actually is the two-year return period flow. As a rule of thumb, in, don't hold me to this, but in most locations, as a rule of thumb, it's approximately equivalent to bank full flow. Now, there's, you'll find as many um, contradictions to that, but a lot of people, on, on, I suppose, on the ground will use it as a rule of thumb. If they see a, a river flowing bank full, they say, oh, that's approximately the two-year return period flow. Um, and at underage locations, under the FSC, we developed a methodology that uses physical catchment descriptors to estimate this QMED value. Okay, I've shown you this already. This is the, the QMED, how it's calculated at a gauge. And uh, once again, I'll make the differentiation between gauges and ungauged. So at a gauge, this is how it's calculated. You just um, use the data, the at site data. These are the gauging stations again, the 216 that, that we started with in the, in the research. So I won't go over that. I've already shown you that slide. Okay, now this is the, the bones of this presentation, is the FSU procedure for calculating design flows for a spe specific or specified return period. I'll, I'll use the example probably throughout today of the 1 in 100 year return period because that's probably most regularly used by people for design purposes. So to calculate QT or Q100, the 100 year return period flow, you would need two things. You need QMED, that's your fundamental building block. And secondly, you apply a growth factor. So depending on what return period you want to get, each return period has its own growth factor. So to get the Q100, the 100-year return period flow, you multiply the QMED by the 100-year growth factor. So two pieces of information are needed. Um, and this presentation shows you how you get the first of those, that QMED value. OK, um, I said earlier that under the FSU research, we came up with an expression that relates the QMED from a gauge to your physical catchment descriptors. What was done in the FSU research was we took the primarily uh, urban, or sorry, rural catchments, so catchments that didn't have any urban fractions in them, and we used these to come up with what we were calling just the QMED rural equation. It's a seven variable equation. So using the catchment descriptors, you plug your catchment descriptors into that equation and it gives you a value for this QMED rural, we'll call it. Um, so it's a way of getting QMED at a gauge without accounting for the urban <coughs> factor or urbanization within that catchment. Secondly then, what you do is you choose a gauge location known as a pivotal site. Now we referred earlier to using equations. They're just equations, you can use them blind. They don't tell you much about what's really happening. So in the FSU, and this uh, applies both to calculating QMED and also to how we actually derive hydrographs at ungauged locations, where we depend on this um, concept of a pivotal site. If you're familiar with the flood estimation handbook in the UK, they've used 
two terms. They've used the donor sites and analog sites. Well, we've just bundled them all together and just call them pivotal sites. And what a pivotal site is, is a site that you have deemed to be hydrologically similar or a site that behaves, a gauge location that behaves in a similar way to your site of interest or your subject, subject site. And we use that pivotal site to make adjustments. So we bring it back to reality as such. We use the equation then bring it back to reality with this pivotal site. And after you carry out that pivotal site adjustment, then you apply your urban factor or your urbanization adjustment. Okay, so this is what the equation looks like. And you'll see a lot of the descriptors I described earlier are there. The most, and I think they're listed in importance, in order of importance here. So area obviously being the most important. The soil types, the BFI soil, the rainfall, the wetness, and then the other features like the flood attenuation from reservoirs, lakes, drainage density, etc. Now, if you started sat down and fiddled around with statistics, you would basically find that that equation is only equivalent to having about one or two years of gauged data, or the, the error that's associated with that equation would be something similar to the error, error that you would associate with only having one or two years of gauged data at a, at, 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 at a gauging station. So that's why we have to use this idea of a pivotal site to adjust it and to improve the estimate. Um, and as I said before, um, you've got your subject site where you're doing your, app, your flood estimation. What you want to do is, it's almost like trying to find a sister site that is a gauge. So you look for this, what we call a pivotal site. I'll just explain to you how that pivotal site is selected. Where your site of interest or your subject site, your ungauged location, um, you find that on, on your river. If there is an upstream or a downstream gauge, we would generally say that they would be quite suitable for your pivotal site. Similarly, you can, if there is no gauge upstream or downstream on that same site, or on that same river rather, you can look for the nearest gauged catchment based on the proximity between the uh, centroid of your subject site and the centroids of a, a range of nearby gauging sa stations. So um, the third, I suppose, option you can look at then is if you, if you have a good knowledge of another site in the country that's very similar to your subject site, you can choose that. And I suppose what we would always say is the fallback. This is probably the last, the last source of um, information as to how you select your pivotal site. You use the area, SAR, and BFI values. It's only based on three catchment descriptors, and that's why we have it down the list, because there are other factors that influence hydrological similarity, like, for instance, the farl, the flood attenuation from reservoirs and lakes, and the slope. So um, this is just, as I say again, another rule of thumb to help you ha figure out how you select your pivotal site. Um, just to show you what it looks like, I suppose, visually. Um, so we picked a subject site here. That's it there. It's an ungauged catchment. We go gauge there. What are we going to do? Well, we can use the equation number one to give us a first estimate for what the QMED value is. The next step then is to define what our pivotal site is. And once again, I picked a straightforward example here. This is a further gauging station, or rather a gauging station that was further downstream our subject site. And um, you can see it probably does behave quite similarly um, in hydrological terms, because it's got the two catchments have a large area in common. So the, you know, a lot of, uh, we'll say, soil types, wetness, all that sort of stuff is all common to both here. So it makes sense that this could be used as the pivotal site. As I say, if that wasn't there, you'd probably try and look at maybe um, a gauging station that would be in maybe this catchment or maybe this catchment here somewhere. Um, it's, it's, it's nearby. The likelihood is that it's got a similar uh, rainfall regime, probably sim similar soil type, similar slopes, because it's on maybe the opposite side of a mountain. You know, little, little bits and pieces like that. But um, that there is what we call the pivotal site in this example. So we will say we chose that as our pivotal site. So it behaves in a similar manner to our subject site. Um, just to try and, I suppose, because most of you are engineers, we like to look at numbers. So I think it's probably good to use a, a, a numerical sort of example here. OK, so we'll talk about the subject site there that we were just looking at a minute ago. That's the one with the yellow push pin there. 
what we've done is we've used the QMED rural equation, this seven variable equation, and we got a value of 145 meters cubed per second. Now, once again, as I say, this is a, an equation only, so you're really working in the dark. Um, so, because you've just blindly applied an equation, you don't know if it's right, if it's wrong, or, you know, are you are even close to having the right figure. So, you don't know. It, it's not gauged. You just don't know what it is. So, what you can do is you go to this pivotal site, this idea of a pivotal site. So, at the other location that I showed you there, at your pivotal site down here, that's a gauge. But you can also treat it as well as if it were ungaged. So what you do is, at your pivotal site, you calculate this, this QMED rural using the catchment descriptors. So you treat it as if it, was, as if it were ungaged. And you look at what your seven variable equation gives you. And in this example, it gives you a 170 meters cubed per second. Now, because it's a gauge, we can actually look at what the true value is. The observed value was, in, in fact, 185 QMEX. So it's telling us something here. It's telling us that our equation underestimates what the true QMED value is by a factor of 1.09. So effectively, you would have to multiply what you get from your equation, multiply it by 1.09, and then you would be up at your true value. So um, when I was explaining what a pivotal site is, pivotal site effectively is a site that we say behaves in a similar manner or has a similar behavior to your um, subject site. So by that rationale, we can then infer that the same adjustment factor would apply here. So you can see the equation here, it's, it's uh, just a simple ratio. Uh, we apply what's called this adjustment factor, the pivotal site adjustment factor. And it's, um, you look at the pivotal site and you divide the gauged value for QMED by what you're getting this QMED rural from your equation. And that's your edge factor adjustment factor. And then quite simply, it's applied back to your subject site. So the subject site, you got 145 QMEX. You will adjust it by this adjustment factor of 1.09. And we say that our adjusted value for QMED is 158 QMEX. So we're nearly, we're nearly finished with our QMED estimation here. Um, there's just one last step that has to be followed, and that's to apply this urban adjustment factor. Now, the urban adjustment factor is is this, is this here. It's 1 plus urbex raised to the power of 1.482. So you multiply your QMED adjusted that we had in that last slide. This works. Yeah. Um, that value there is multiplied up by your urban adjustment factor. And that's when you get your final QMED value. So at this point now, we have derived our QMED, our final value for QMED. So that's the first part of these, these two uh, snippets of information that you need to be able to calculate your uh, design flow. The next step now is to move on and then get the growth factors for that design okay, flow. I'll just go into the portal now. Okay, so we finished that rainfall declaration frequency. So what we're going to do now is move on to the, actually, sorry. Yeah, something that people may, may want is down here, uh, you'll be familiar with uh, rainfall, rainfall profiles, you know, the winter and summer rainfall profiles. The output you get for this catchment, you can actually generate a rainfall profile just by clicking on that button at the end of the rainfall DDF module. Okay, so flood frequencies. Um, once again, once you click on the tab, it brings you to an overview map of the country. Again, you've got your control panel on the right-hand side. So this is guiding you through what, what you need to do. So first step is to select your subject site. And as I say again, you can type in townland, whatever, whatever location or whatever information you have, that'll help you. Now, you don't have to use this search facility. You can, you can do the zoom by window, et cetera, and all, all of that stuff, as, as you would normally do. But um, I'll just go back to that location we were talking about earlier. And go down to it. Just turn on the rivers there. Okay, on the right hand side here, it gives you a few options. You can view gauged metadata. So if there was a gauging station in our window here, oh, actually there is one there. View gauged metadata, you can click on the gauge. 
that's nearby, it'll tell you the catchment descriptors for that gauge. It'll show you the annual maximum series for the gauge also. So that's that's the first option. Um, what I'll do is go back. Okay. Then the next thing you can do is if you want to perform your flood estimation at a gauge, gauged site, you can click on that button. But what we're interested in here is calculating a flood, a design flood at this ungaged location. So you click on suggest an ungaged subject site. So that's what you're going to do. You're going to suggest an ungaged subject site to the portal and you click on the node or nearby. And it automatically zooms out to show you the contributing catchment. And on the right hand side in the control panel again you'll see a lot of the more important i suppose vital statistics of of this catchment things like the area the bfi soil the sar the farl drain d the whole lot is there and what you would do then is if you're happy enough with that you click on this button here to proceed now you'll notice here it's it's uh, thrown up a question saying are you sure you want to use this subject site for calculations this is part of your flood estimation report. As you go through each of the steps in the portal, the portal will ask you different questions, decisions. It's asking you to confirm your decisions. And every time you make a decision, it'll record it. And then that decision is then present, presented back to you at the end when you print out your flood estimation report. So if you were to come back to this maybe five, six months later and you don't know why did I select this or what did I do, it's there in your flood estimation report. So if I click OK, that will get recorded. So it's recorded into the portal now, and you've moved on to the next step. So you'll see here it's um, showing up that the subject site has been selected. We're on to our next step here, which is pivotal site. Once again, your on-screen stepwise guidance tells you what a pivotal site is. And you can go on to the technical research report that relates to how you select all the pivotal sites. Um, across the top here, I think it's worth showing you What's, what these buttons mean. Um, the portal at this stage is, is suggesting a pivotal site. We basically coded in a few of those rules that I showed you, those rules of thumb earlier, and the portal will try and suggest them to you. Now, it doesn't mean that the portal is right. This is just to help people along. It's a way of suggesting to people, you know, maybe this, this is probably a good one to use, but it's all up to your own uh, personal judgment, your, your own engineering judgment, we say. But at least what it's doing is it's at least giving you a few pointers. So it's, it, it suggests the first pivotal site. And what it has done here is you can see the yellow marker. That was the site or subject site or site of interest. But it's shown us this is the site that it's proposing as the pivotal site. And what you'll see is if it was to zoom out further, you'll see more of these blue push pins. These are other alternative candidates for this pivotal site. But at the moment, it's pointing us towards this one, 18050, in on the Blackwater. What we can do is we can look at, well, I'll show you one piece of information. See that there, show PCDNA max data. So this is the pivotal site that we're looking at, or that's being suggested to us, rather, which is station 18050. And it has all the catchment descriptors for that um, location. And it also shows you the annual maximum series for that station too. Another piece of information, and I think it's on the WinFAP, unless I'm wrong, it's on the WinFAP CD-ROM or part of the flood estimation handbook. We've something similar to that. It's or just just to be different, we've called them catchment attribute thumbnails. And what it does is it presents you with nine plots of each of the catchment descriptors. And what it does is it tells you information about all of the gauges in the country. Uh, I'll zoom into, I will take this one here, which is drain D. Each gray dot represents one of the gauges that are in the FSU database that we use for all the flood estimations. So you can see if I hold on one there, that's for gauged catchment number 07010. And it's telling you the drainage density for that catchment would be 0.976. So it does it for all of them. But what we're interested here in um, and you can see most of these plots will always be associated with um, with a legend that tells you what, what, what's going on really. So that blue X is your ungaged catchment. It's your subject site that you're trying to calculate this flow at. And the red dot 
represents the value for your pivotal site. So you can have a look at it and see, well, is the drainage density similar between my site and the site that's being suggested as this pivotal site? So they're quite close. That's quite close there. Uh, so they're, they're, they're quite similar in, 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 in values or in magnitude. So that would you know, be a good pointer towards us to say, yeah, that, that looks good. Um, obviously the area, now I've, I've chosen a very s simple one here. So you can see here the blue X, red dot, very close by. So that means they're very similar in area. The, this is just a visual aid to help you kind of gauge how similar your catchment is to this pivotal catchment. Um, another one I should have, uh, mm, sorry, another two I should have shown you there was the Farrell value and the slope value. So the Farrell value, you can see here, they're very similar. Um, and the slope value as well is, is, is very similar for both. So okay, just say we're happy enough and we've decided that this 18050 is going to be our pivotal site. So we, we can click, oh, sorry. I'll go back again. I just want to show you this as well. If you happen to have some data nearby from a gauge that you've recently discovered was there but no one knew about it, you can actually upload your own information for a pivotal site. So if you have your own AMAC series, you can upload it there and it'll be used in this session as a pivotal site. So anyway, for our example, we're going to select this station number 18051 and say we're happy with it as our pivotal site. And what the portal will do then is it'll give you a summary of the um, comparisons between the two. So for each catchment descriptor, it tells you what the descriptors are for each, but more importantly, it shows you this column here, the factorial difference. So you can see the catch contributing catchment area, the factorial difference is 1.011, which means the areas are very similar. The BFI, BFI soil is 1.01, extremely similar again. And all the other descriptors as you go down there, they're very, very similar. So the closer to one that is, for all of those descriptors, the more confident that you can be that this is actually behaving in a similar manner to your subjects. But one thing I would say to you as well is you have to put in a reason why you're selecting it. Um, more for your own protection because I know some people will do that and then hit accept and move on. And then the day you go up and stand in front of the judge and he asks you, what, what does that mean? you're going to be in trouble. So um, do as I say, but not as I do, because I'm, I'm the person who does all that, just typing X, Y, Z. Um, always put in a good reason. Um, number one, to keep the judge happy. Number two, um, that if you come back, you can see the logic behind how you actually picked this site. Because as I say, it could be a couple of months later, uh, it could be a year later, and you don't know what you did a few months ago. I don't know what I did this morning, so that's a good example of why you need to write this stuff down. So um, I would be saying on this one nearby and on So yeah, so you record it properly there. Now at this point, if you think maybe there is another gauge catchment, you can still go back, back to this button review. So it'll bring you back a step and you can pick another site and then you can look at your factorial differences again. But um, just to keep things moving, I'll just say accept this. So automatically what it does is it says, right, you've chosen your pivotal site, let's move on to the next part. QMED estimation. This is where we start talking about the adjustments and everything that goes with it. Um, usually I would say, look, just use the full period of record. But if for some reason you think that there's a major change in the catchment in the last 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it is, you've different options here. So you can use the last 20 years of record at the pivotal site for your adjustment. Or you can even do things like you can use part of the record. So you have a sliding scale here. So if you want to just maybe use a period of a few years in the middle somewhere, you can move that sliding scale up and down, and it'll use that to calculate your, your QMED at the pivotal site before you do your adjustments. But anyway, um, I won't go into that too much, just to show you that it's there. Um, people will have different reasons for choosing different periods, but I would generally say try and keep it to the full period of record unless you have some very good reason why not to. Um, it also tells you that at the end it's going to apply an urban adjustment factor of 1 plus urbex to the power of 1.482 here. Um, I would generally leave it there. I'm happy enough with that. That's got research behind it. Some people may have a different reason for changing that, but you can change it if you want. Uh, sometimes people use it for some sort of sensitivity analysis, whatever, whatever it is they need to do. 
but we just have it there that you can change that adjustment um, exponent if you need to. But anyway, uh, going back to what I was uh, explaining there, okay, you picked your subject site, you picked your pivotal site, uh, it asks you, how do you want to calculate QMED at the pivotal site? So we'll just say using the full period of record. And then you just click Calculate QMED. So what it will do is, it will show you the value that you get at your subject site if you use that QMED rural equation, which is whatever, 89 point. Um, and then what it tells you is um, the pivotal site, what the value is, the gauged value at your pivotal site is, which is here 124. Um, and it also tells you then what the adjustment factor is. So in this example, it's 1.338 something. So the adjustment factor is the important thing that we're looking for here. So what the portal does is it takes your QMED rural, what you got from your equation. It might be better with the point. Yeah, it takes your QMED rural, what you got from the equation, multiplies it by your adjustment factor, and then it gives you your final value for QMED, which is 124.6499. Now that has the urban adjustment included in it. So that's it. That's you're, you're at the end of your um, flood estimation. Well, the QMED part of it. Okay. Once again, the flood estimation report is still running in the background. It's recording all of your uh, choices, all of your selections. So once again, you get to a kind of an important point in your st in your um, flood estimation. So it asks you if you want, if you're happy enough to proceed. So yeah, I accept. Okay. So we've got the QMED part. Um, the next thing it asks you to do is, do you want to calculate or perform a pooled analysis? Before we go into that, I'll just explain the background to it. It's only about five or six slides, so it shouldn't take too long. Um, okay. So we're right. We're at the point where we've got our QMED. Now the next thing is we have to get the growth factors. So I'll more so concentrate on how you calculate the growth factors at your uh, ungauged location, but I will describe also how you do it at a, a gauge location. Okay, um, in this presentation I'll show you the three, I suppose, options that uh, you'll be presented with in the portal, or the three ways you can get your flood frequency analysis or your growth factors. The first one is a single site flood frequency analysis. That's where you're at a gauge with a lot of data. Second one is a pooled flood frequency analysis. That's where you're at an ungauged location in the middle of nowhere. You have no gauge, no information whatsoever. And then the third one is a combination of the two. It's called the combined single site and pooled flood frequency analysis. <laughs> I'll explain that later. Okay, just to go a little bit more in depth and explain what they all are. So the first one there is the single site flood frequency analysis. Now that's performed at a gauged location, where you have a gauge, and where you have a, a good long record, a period of record, and uh, you've got a large number of AMAX uh, values. And this is where, when I say a large number of AMAX values, um, I'm saying that the number of annual maximum data that you have at this gauge is greater than the return period or your target return period. So for example, if you've got 65 years of data at a gauge, and you're looking to get a 20 year return period flood, then you would use this single site analysis. Um, as I said before, the pool flood frequency analysis is for ungauged locations. And thirdly, a combined single site and pooled flood frequency analysis performed at locations where your number of years of data at the gauge is, is quite small in comparison to the target return period that you're looking to calculate. So 20 years of data at a site, you want to get a 100 year return period rainfall, you would be probably having, you would not be able to use the single site analysis. You would have to focus on using the combined single site or pooled flood frequency analysis. Okay, this is the first one of those um, approaches. So it's the single site flood frequency analysis, n greater than t. So in this example, uh, the number of years of data at this gauge, it's for a gauge location, may I add. At this gauge location, you've got 40 years of data, and you've been asked to calculate the 20 year return period flow. So it's, um, this is probably the simplest of all. What you use is you use a different, I suppose, uh, equ yeah, equations for ranking each of the flows at a gauge. So I won't go into too much, but what you really do is you use this, um, a ranking scheme. 
and you plot your rank across the bottom. So largest flood, smallest flood, and you rank them in increasing order. And on the left-hand side here on the y-axis, you've got your flow that corresponds to each of the pieces of information or the measurements at the gauge. So these are all the annual maximum series plotted. Um, what I was saying there about how they're ranked, you use a different type of rank for different types of distribution. So in this example, um, we used, a, I think it's a Gringorton plotting position to rank the flows. And that gives you um, the best fit line, or what you do is you apply a straight line to it. And similarly, there's um, another type of equation or a curve called an EV1 curve. Um, I suppose what I should probably go back and do is just explain what these are. Um, pick an analogy. I would say if you're using Excel and you have a series of data and you want to fit a best fit line to it, you can apply lots of curves even. So you can use things like a straight line curve or a straight line, uh, polynomial curves, exponential curves, logarithmic curves to fit data. Similarly, what we're really doing here is we're plotting up the data at a gauge and we're looking to see what's the best curve to fit that data. And really what you're looking at is you plot it, this curve effectively and you look at how well the data fits it. So you can see here we've got two different types of curve or distribution. So the distribution here is the LN2, the log normal 2 distribution, and the EV1 distribution. Think of it as analogous to the likes of you know, a polynomial or um, maybe a logarithmic curve. And what we're doing here is just to see how well the data at the gauge fits that curve or that straight line or the distribution, all interchangeable. So I suppose the best way of really picking which of these is the best fit to the data at your gauge is to look at this idea of the snaking and how well it fits. So you can see here it starts above. And when I say snaking, it's, it's snaking around that line. So it's above, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. So it's kind of it's tracing or tracking the line as you go through. So you can see this one starts above, goes nearly below, back above, down below, up above again, and stays above. Whereas if we take the other example, you're above, below, above, back up, below, sorry, down above, and you're beginning to head back down again. So I would be saying that this particular curve here, or rather the data is hugging this EV1 distribution better than it is in this example here. Ever so slightly, but this one would seem to be hugging the line better or snaking around it. So in the portal, what you, really all you're doing, you're being asked to select which one you think is the best fit. And what you do is, in the portal, you go and you tell the portal that you're, you think the EV one is the best fit. And um, what the portal will do then is, it'll use that EV one distribution, use some of the information from your gauge data, and it'll produce your growth factors. Straightforward, it spits it out there. So that's your return periods along the top there. Your growth factors are shown there. Just to tell you that 1.68 is the 100 year growth factor in this situation. And um, <coughs> because you've already calculated your uh, QMED earlier on, it brings that in and multiplies it up by your growth factor. So it's, it, at this point, you're, you're being told what your 1 in 100 year return period flow is. And in this, this example, it's 134. So that's how you would do it at a gauge location. Straightforward enough. You're using the data from the gauge itself, fitting the best distribution to it. And then that tells you what your, your, your growth factors are. A little bit more complicated. This is where you are at an ungauged location where you have no gauge. So you've got no gauge, you've got no annual, manual maximum data um, which you can plot up and you know put a best fit curve on it. So what do you do? Well, the first step is you rely on information from other gauges or you pool the data or pool information from other gauges. And what, what you effectively do is you get a group of gauging stations that once again, that are hydrologically similar to your subject site. And the way you do that is you look at the area, the SAR, and the BFI values. And this is used in a, an equation. It's, if, if most of you remember from your leave insert maths, it's the distance between two points. In a similar way, we use it for the three descriptors, area, SAR, BFI. We input the B area, SAR, and BFI for our subject site. We find the distance in a three-dimensional space or 
hydrological similarity, for want of a better word, um, and compared to other gauges around the country. So in this example here, for our subject site, it was found that station number 31072 was the most hydrologically similar from the point of view of area SAR and BFI soil. And that's the, the, the distance between the two, or the hydrological similarity. So you'll see that's the most similar, 1.3 is the distance between them. And as you go down, it gets less similar. What this is doing here is, it's calculating the most similar. It tells you the number of years that are at that gauge. And you can see at the very end, it, it keeps a sum of them. So 26, so it's the first gauge, obviously. The sum is going to be just 26. And the way this pooling approach works is that you keep adding stations to this group until you hit the 5T rule. Um, as I said before, I'm using the example of a 1 in 100 year flood. So in this example, you're trying to aim for 500 years of annual maximum data. So we keep bringing in the next most similar, the next most similar, the next most similar, etc. Each of those has a period of record. We keep adding the value until we're hitting nearly the 500 mark. Now when I say the 5T rule, it's not strictly 5T. You don't have to get spot on 500 but you have to try and get as close to it as possible. So you'll see in the example here, we've got 483 years of data. When we've got, I won't count them, I'll say there's 15 stations there. You'll see there we've got 483 years of data, which is 17 away from 500. If we were to bring in this next one, we will be 29 years away from 500. So we've gone further away from this magical 5T number. So that's why it stopped at that. So it's 483. So that's your pooling group. So you've basically selected what's called a pooling group of gauging stations. And each of these gauging stations obviously has annual maximum flows, annual maximum data, this AMAC series. Now, back to analogies again. You're all familiar with the AMAC series that I showed you earlier. You can calculate different things for that, like the median. You can also calculate things like the mean, standard deviation, maximum, minimum, their statistics. Um, we're not worried about the equation behind it, we just know these are statistics. In a similar way, for each gauge, you can calculate what's called the L moments. So there's different types of L moments. There's L skewness, L kurtosis, um, LLCV. You don't need to know about them, but just know that they are a statistic that's based on the information from this AMAC series. So I'll just show you <coughs> an example of what it looks like. Plot it up. Okay, so back to this whole idea. Here's a statistic for the information at a gauge. So for example, we take this one here, 22035. If you look at the annual maximum data for that gauge, you can calculate this l kurtosis statistic. You can also calculate this l skewness. Once again, don't worry about what it is. It's, it's done in the portal, so it's not that you have to sit down with a piece of paper and go through it all. What you can do then is, once you've calculated these statistics, you can plot them on um, uh, um, L moment ratio diagram. That's what this thing here is with these green lines. That's a standard, that's static, never changes. Those different lines, they represent different distributions. So once you can calculate L kurtosis and L skewness, you can plot the values for each gauging station that's in your pooling group. And you can see the way they're in a, a cloud effectively there. So going back to the start of the universe, everything was dust, and eventually it formed into a sun in the middle or something like that. I would always think of this in terms of it's like a center of gravity. So what we can do is we get a weighted average of, of all of the L moments for all the gauging stations. And it tells us that this is the, if you were to average them all up and put them into one clump, this is what you would get. So this is the pooled L moment ratio for your subject site. And you've used all these other gauging stations to come up with this value. And what this L moment ratio plot does, it plots up three different distributions that are supported in the FSU. So you'll see the first one at the top there is in black, the GLO, more commonly used in the FEH in England or the UK. Then you have another one there, the blue one is the log normal three type distribution. And then the one at the bottom there is the GEV distribution, which I think a lot more people would find is used in Ireland. So what we would be doing here in general is two things. You probably look at the spread of the data. So you can see all the black dots here. They tend to be kind of down low, 
And as you move up, they get a bit higher up. You can see the general sense of the green GEV line does that too. It starts low and then begins to kind of curl up. But um, what we would be doing here is looking at that grey dot. It's actually nearly sitting on the green line. So this would be telling me that for our subject site, the distribution for the growth uh, curve is most similar to a GEV, the green line there. It's close to the green line. The general, I suppose, sense of all of the, the uh, cloud there tends to look like it's moving along the same way as that green line. And so in the portal, once again, all you're really doing is telling the portal what distribution fits it the best. So you can see here, now I've actually, sorry, that should say GEV there. I've, you would go up here, click the drop down menu, tell it it's a GEV, and then what happens is you move on and it'll plot your growth curve. And once again, it'll give you the information along the bottom here. Your return periods will give you your growth factors and it'll give you your, your peak flows. So that's how you do your pools for frequency analysis. You're using information from other gauges, using the statistics from those other gauges, pooling them all together, weighting them, putting an average weighting on them, and then, then you, you have your uh, information for your subject site. What I'll go on to now, well, I won't dwell on this too long, but um, yeah, it's, it's definitely worth noting, this combined single site and pooled fluid frequency analysis. Um, this is where the record length at your gauge is an awful lot, or is much less than the target return period you're looking to calculate. Um, we'll take this example here, where it's 40 years of AMAX data at your site, but the target return period is 100. So you're, you just don't have enough data to really extrapolate up to a 100 year flood. So what do you do? You, you, well, what we're saying you do is, you use this combined analysis, the combined single site and pooled flood frequency analysis. And what that does is, the period of record at your gauge, it'll apply a certain weighting to it. So in this example, I was saying that there was 40 years of data at the gauge. We want the 100 year return period flow. So what we'll do is, the growth curve at the gauge is going to get a weighting of 0.4. And then the pooled analysis, if you were to treat that gauge as if it didn't exist, your pooled analysis will get a weighting of 0.6. And then what the portal will do is it will plot the two different growth curves. So the um, green line there is your single site analysis, the red line being your pooled analysis. And then the blue line here down the middle is your combined single site and pooled flood frequency analysis. Now, we've done it in such a way in the portal that if you're not happy with that weighting, if you think that you've got the best possible information you could ever get at a gauge, at your gauge, you can actually use this slider here to give more weighting to the growth curve at your gauge. So it's, it's more of a, you know, what I think kind of a factor here. Generally, if you don't know any better, stick to what the portal gives you. But if you have more information and you're very certain that your gauge is very, very good, you can change that weighting. But once again, at the end point, what it does is it'll give you your growth, or sorry, return periods, your growth factors on the next line, and finally, it'll give you your, your design flows. So that's the combined single site pool flood frequency analysis. And well, let's do, just before we break, we're not doing too badly. <coughs> I'll run through one example of how we actually perform a pooled analysis. So this is, I suppose, what people will be using maybe 90% of the time. We're going to do a pooled analysis using this ungauged location. Um, something I didn't do the last time was save, so we'll just do that again. Okay, so we're moving on now. By the way, actually, something the portal will notice. It's, see here, single site, flood frequency analysis. The portal has automatically skipped that because it, it knows it's an ungauged location. So it's just moved on. And it automatically is able to tell us that you're using a, perf a pooled analysis. So I'd ask you to enter your return period, your target return period, which I would enter as 100 here. And now what it asks me here is how am I going to develop this pool of gauging stations? Um, we put in a second option. The first option here is Euclidean. Um, probably a misnomer, but this is the hydrological similarity based on area, SAR, and BFI. That is the default option. 
Now, what you can do, and I've seen where there was um, studies done on, for example, the East Coast, to look at growth factors on the East Coast, you can actually pick a geographical pooling scheme. So you can use your pooling group or you can select your pooling group from catchments that are nearby or in the same sort of region or area. But as I say, the default is, use, is to use this hydrological similarity or the Euclidean distance measure. So you select that. What I will show you here is you've got your pooling group. It's done what I said before. It's um, picked the most hydrologically similar station, which it's no surprise this is the one that's just further downstream, the one we used as its pivotal site. It tells you how similar it is, so 0 0.051 means it's extremely similar. Um, we've just thrown this in as well. Again, I said you, these appear everywhere. Um, they're a help. Once again, they're a help. So it will be able to tell you and give you an indicator of how hydrologically similar some of these are. These are rules of thumb again. It's only a guide, but um, you can see the DIJ measures are you know, between less than one, it's, it's very similar. Okay, so this is our pooling group here. The number of years for each gauge is shown again, and it adds them up until you get close to 500. Once again, you can see here it's 13 away from 500. And this one is 18 away from 500, so this is where it stops. Now, when I was showing you the QMED estimation, we talked about these cats, these catchment attribute thumbnails. It's actually mouthful when you're standing in front of a room of people. Um, what you can do is, you can look at your subject site here in the, the blue cross again, get the same notation. And if you hover over it, over your subject site, it tells you that your SAR, your annual average rainfall is 1,470 millimetres. But what it also does is, back again, you can see down here on the legend, it shows you the values for all of the gauging stations that are in your pooling group. And as you can see, they're all kind of clustered underneath your blue cross here. So they're all quite similar, which is reassuring. What you would, what you would probably find sometimes, or you will maybe find it sometimes, is we'll take an example here. Just say you had a gauge that was way down here, and it's um, from an extremely dry catchment. So it's very dissimilar. You could say that the annual average rainfall is very, very dissimilar. And then what you can do is, what I'll show you is, you probably look at a few other of these. The ones I would always suggest to people to look at would be the other descriptors, but remembering that this pooling group is based on the top ones, area, SAR, BFI soil. I would also look at farl and slope, because they would have big effects on some of the growth behavior for, for growth curves. So you can see here, this is one that's way, way off. The final value at our subject site is 0.999, which is effectively 1. Down here, we have a final value of 0.677. So this is very much dissimilar. So just say we want to remove that from the pooling group. We can go back, and we can close that. Hmm? Oh, sorry, table view. So uh, was it 33070 I said? Yeah. So we're f we found that this one is quite dissimilar. So we want to get rid of that. We're going to take this fellow off the football pitch and we're going to put him in the subs. And we're saying here that, sorry, I should have just gone through that. What you do is you click on the X button on the X that corresponds to that gauge. And it's telling you here, exclude station 33070 from analysis. So you have to tell the portal why you're, you're throwing it out. And once again, this is to record it for your own information. So file is the reason we found there. Okay, so you're, you're telling us, look, this is why I'm ruling it out, because the file value is very different. So this particular gauge I'm looking at, it's very hydrologically dissimilar. So I want to get rid of it. So you explain why, and you click Confirm. Now you can see your man is on the subs bench now. He's been taken off. And what they've done is they've brought in a sub from this reserve list. So 28001 is now brought in. And you'll see the figure has changed. I think, was it 487 before? We brought in this 
next gauging station and it's now up at the 507 mark so it's sticking to the 5T rule still even after you remove a gauge from the pooling group it brings up another one keeps your 5T rule intact so you can continue doing that deleting other ones that you find are maybe dissimilar so once you're happy with your pooling group and once you've consulted all these catchment attribute thumbnails all the other sort of visual aids you can accept the group Now what this does is it, it runs away, starts plotting up a lot of the L moment diagrams. And you'll see here, th this is the one we use for known gauge location, this, this diagram here, this extreme, or the um, L moment ratio plot. And in the portal, a lot of these diagrams, just to show you, you can actually, you know, zoom you can zoom in a bit closer. And looking at our grey diamond here, you can see it's very close to the black line this GLO, and that's your grey dot there. This is the L moments for your subject site. So you can see that they're quite close to this GLO distribution. So quite simply, you go back up, and you tell the portal that you think it's a GLO distribution. And it redoes the growth curve for you. Now, I know that might look a bit funny. It's kind of curling upwards. But the um, that's because the, uh, the, uh, the, sorry, the, um, coordinates or the um oh uh, the scale is is, is squashed and um, so um yeah i wouldn't worry about it too much there is some inbuilt um backup in the portal that if it's giving you like a crazy growth curve one that flattens out or one that actually zooms up it'll actually come back and tell you you know this is going crazy are you sure you want to use this distribution so if we're happy enough with that we can click accept <coughs> And then click on the review analysis button in your control panel on the right again. And what it does now, it shows you the growth curve. And again, it tells you the distribution that you chose. And it also shows you your return periods again. It shows your growth factors. Uh, 1.95 being the 100 year growth factor here. And your design peak flow for that particular location, the 100 year flow is 243.47 QMEX. And that is your design flow finished. And once again, as I said before, it's going to ask you to uh, accept it. And that will be recorded into your flood estimation report. Um, so it'll ask you, do you want to proceed on to the next step? So you could just go OK <coughs> and save it at that point. OK, so you've saved all of your flood frequency analysis side of things. Um, that really is the end of the first session as regards presentations and demonstrations. And um, I think we have about 10 or 12 minutes until we get our tea, coffee, sandwiches. And um, what I can do is we have a bit of time. So what I might do is take a few questions, if, if you'd like. Um, one thing I would say is um, if you are going to ask a question, we'll try and keep it to maybe one question per person. And if you could tell us who you are and where you're from, um, that would be great. So um, I'll open the floor for any questions that you might have. That's good. <laughs> yeah, Jim. Quick one. Minimum size, rough and interest in small catchments. How does it cope with catchments, say, less than 20 square kilometers? Okay, um, yeah, this is something that was emerging as, as we were going through the research. What limit do we put on it? Now, I think the smallest catchment that was used in the F3 research was 15 square kilometres. So um, what we did, well, what Fasil did, I'll blame it on him, so if anything goes wrong, Fasil will get the blame. Um, <laughs> what we did was we looked at smaller catchments. Now, they weren't necessarily FSU catchments because um, there are a number of small catchments. They would not have met the criteria for an FSU station. So it, it was limited what we could do because there is such a small amount of small catchments in the country. So it's hard to form a robust research based on small catchments because simply we just don't have enough. So as I say, it was guideline. So what we did was we looked at the different methods that are out there for smaller catchments under 30 square kilometers. Um, for example, we looked at the IH124 method and we used our own FSU method. We used some of the older flood studies report methods. We looked at a range of methods to see what would work 
uh, based on these small number of gauging stations that we did have that were under the, the 30 square kilometre mark. Um, and what we found was that both the FEH method and the FSU, the QMED rural equation, actually worked quite well, um, down to a catchment size of about five square kilometres. Um, so what we would be saying here is above 25, 30, FSU methodologies are fine to use. Between the kind of 25, 30 mark down to five square kilometres, we would say, yeah, use your FSU methods, but treat it with caution and back up your decisions by using maybe two or three other methods. And when you go beneath five square kilometres, the problem is a lot of the resolution of the data sets, the underlying data sets, they're on two kilometre grids or maybe even larger. So anything below five square kilometres in this regard is fiction, well, I won't say fictional, but you can pull it out of you know where, um, below five square kilometres, because there purely just is not enough information out there uh, on which to you know state you know this is right or this is wrong. Below five square kilometres, I think we found that maybe the rational, modified rational method would work better in Ireland than maybe some of the other um, traditional methods that have been used in Ireland. That was a long answer to a short question. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I grew up in the SPI. Would the pooling group analysis um, be, when you're deciding what models to include, what models to get rid of, so that can you, when you're reviewing like your files and your all the other PCBs, can you find where actually all the places are geographically located? Say if you want to get rid of one in the east of the country when all the others are in the west. Yes, you can. And I probably didn't draw enough attention to that earlier. Um, I'll try and go back to it and hopefully you can still get it there. Um, yeah, it, in the background it does show up. Now I think because I've saved it and moved on and, and progressed. But what I would say is in the background when you're going through this process, it will actually show you the outlines of your pooling group. Oh. It, it is there now, it's just the window appeared above it. But if you were to move it to one side, um, oh sugar. No, I've, I've saved it and moved on, so they're, they're not showing up. But yes, those um, the pooling group can be seen geographically in the background. If you were to move the um, that pooling group table to one side, you'll be able to see the outlines. In a similar man manner, you can see the outlines, and then you'll have your push pin showing the location of all these, all the pooling group. But yeah, that, that, that will be there um, in the background. Um, yep. Um, what they've done, uh, this is, Metairn did this, but what they did was they were able to actually calculate the hourly. And effectively what they've done is just extrapolated it downwards, but they said no more than 15 minutes. And so they weren't able to go down to one minutes, one minute durations or anything less. They made the decision that 15 minutes was, I suppose, the, the most you could uh, extrapolate downwards. So um, the exact stats and everything behind it that would, you know, give the reasons for it, I couldn't tell you, but it, it was a decision that they were able to make. So, um, yeah, there always is that question, if you've only got hourly data, how come you can get 15 minute data out of it? But yeah, purely it was the distribution that they, the growth or the, um, yeah, the distribution they applied, uh, they were able to just extrapolate down, but as I say, the limit was 15 minutes. And similarly, the 600 hours at the upper end, that was the limit that they said they would cut it off at because the uncertainty gets very, very large when you get up to those long durations. Yep. Um, Brian Mullins, Waterways Ireland. Do you take any account of the canals? Um, no. Are, there are places where we have overflows which would affect some. Um, no, no. Uh, what we've done is, yeah, purely natural rivers. Um, the interaction between the two is not accounted for in this. So you could, in theory, actually calculate flows down in Cork City, even though there is the dams above it. But what I would be saying is, yes, all of this is a river in its natural state without other influences as such. Um, if you were bringing in a study that included the canals, I would say it, it is site-specific. Sp a lot of this is generalised. It is generalised, and I suppose we can't take into account every single situation. Um, so some of them have, well, I won't say been glossed over, but we couldn't kind of cover all eventualities. But yeah, I would say if someone was doing a study, um, I would say know your catchment. 
so that you know that there is influences such as, we'll say, extraction points or whatever. But no, canals were not specifically included in this. There is going another year or two to actually update a lot of the Blue Line River network, and we could probably look at that. Um, but um, yeah, we're, we're going to try and let this bed in for another year or two before we go doing any major changes. Um, let's see, we've got, I'll take, yeah, both of you, I'll take your question first. Yeah, um, well, I, I presume, yeah, I'll take that as part 1A and 1B of a question. Um, yeah, starting with the factorial standard error. Um, I think I said in one of the very earliest slides, the factorial standard error that applies to that, to that QMED equation is 1.37. So 1.37, uh, if you multiply the QMED rural value by 1.37, you get your 68% uh, limit. If you divide it by 1.37, you get your lower 68% limit. And similarly, if you multiply by 1.37 squared and divide the value by 1.37 squared, you get the upper and lower 95 percentile confidence intervals. The practice normally undertake or taken by the OPWC, for example, if you were um, lodging a Section 50 application, you would have to add in the factorial standard error. Factorial standard error applies to the QMED, QMED rural equation used purely just in isolation. Now once, in our methodology here, you bring in a gauging station, and then what you do is you make adjustments based on that gauging station. So if, if, I suppose if you were to look at it from a statistical point of view, the um, factorial standard error sort of goes out the window once you bring in a mistress, which is this pivotal site. So, um, as I say, if you're using the QMED rural equation in isolation, yes, you can apply the factorial standard error, but that then basically ceases to uh, apply once you bring in the, the pivotal site. Um, secondly, there, uh, the question about climate change. Well, actually, just to say something on, on that point as well, uh, you can use those factorial standard error limits to give yourself sort of a sanity check for what you finally get from the portal. Because um, I know that's one thing that we do is we would first set out, if we were doing it in the office, we'd set out what the factorial standard errors, uh, what the limits are, and then we go through, run through a, a flood estimation in the portal, and then go back after we're finished and look to see where they are within those limits. So it's, it's a good way of checking that you're, you're, you know, you're within reasonable limits. So it's, um, as I say, all this stuff is at ungage locations, so it's a good way of maybe just giving yourself, yourself a bit of an indication that you are, you know, in the right direction. Um, the question about climate change, I would be saying, yes, you have to add your own climate change adjustments afterwards. The reason we have not put it into this, and it was intentional, was um, I think since the start of this, there's been a lot of changes and different opinions on what the different scenarios uh, are and what the adjustments should be. I think currently under the CFRAM program, the OPW were using um, an increase in for climate change of 20%. That's the for the mid-range future scenario. And then for the high-range range future scenario, you add on about 30%. Now, that could change next year. Somebody could come up with some extensive research from NUI Minute or somewhere like that and turn around and tell us, well, no, that's not a, a good figure to use. You should be using less or more. From the point of view, we didn't hard-code it in, into this. So we've, we've left it that just apply what is the current, I suppose, um, adjustments, because, you know, it is subject to change, and that's why. Okay. And there was another question. Yeah, yeah just a quick one. What's been the biggest difference you found between the predicted QMED management and the actual Um I'll put it this way. The, the biggest difference I would have found would be just a little over a factor of two. And I haven't looked everywhere yet. I'm sure I could probably get something higher than that. Um, but what I would say is, yeah, you could be worried by that kind of a figure. But once again, if you're choosing a good pivotal site to work with, um, I wouldn't be as worried that your QMED rural is coming up as being, or sorry, the difference between your pivotal site and your equation uh, version of QMED. Um, I would say that that is still good because 
you can still use that adjustment if your site is similar. Now, um, yeah, as I say, there, there's not too many that come across with that, that big of a value. Once again, I'll uh, say that it is still generalized. So um, uh, there's a lot of stuff there. There's 134,000 points. So um, over the coming years, we'll be doing a lot of follow-up research to try and see what, what to basically to gauge what we have out there and what kind of um, errors we can get. We are currently looking at a few different schemes where rather than just using one pivotal site, you can use a number of pivotal sites. Um, how you choose them, a lot, lot of different kind of follow-up research that's going on. But um, the few that we have used so far, they seem to be working out fairly well. That's where we've pr treated a, a location as being ungaged and then done the whole pivotal site adjustment. But um, generally, we're finding them quite close, within a, maybe no more than maybe 15 to 25% out. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It's, it's, it's come up before, but I would be saying, yeah, around about a factor of two, say half or double is, is probably the, the most I've seen. Okay, I think we're, yeah, we're just about at uh, time to break for tea. So could you, could everyone be back here at, we're going to take a half an hour, so 10 past, 10 past four. Okay, we're going to move on now to the next part of the presentations, which is uh, creating a hydrograph shape. Um, this second session, I think, is a little easier on the brain, so um, this is the only, I suppose, difficult part. And after that, we'll, we'll start talking about some of the actual features of the website and maybe get into a little bit more depth and show you how they work. So um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll hand you over to Fasil again. <coughs> Welcome again. Um, um, uh, most of the time, p people would do uh, the flat frequency analysis, and they might stop there. But um, some would proceed to create um, the hydrograph shape uh, for the flat frequency analysis they have done. Um, the hydrograph shape might be used as an input to further. Um, say, hydraulic modeling. So the aim of uh, this part of the FSU uh, web portal is to construct <coughs> a simplified design hydrograph um, shape that is characteristic to the catchment of interest for a given return period. Um, this characteristic hydrograph shape can be constructed either from observed gauged hydrographs or it can be synthesized using the physical catchment descriptors that we showed you earlier. So what I will do is I will just um, show you how hydrograph with analysis is carried out at gauged locations and also how hydrographs are synthesized at engaged locations. Um, in order to generate a hydrograph shape, you need um, mostly two, two kinds of data, the physical catchment descriptors and uh, a flow data at 15 minute interval. Um, the FSU has used in order to develop the hydro hydrograph width analysis module, it used about 89 gauging stations with a class of A1 and A2. So that is uh, a, the a largest hydrograph, a sample of largest hydrograph at a gauging station. Um, so for, for hydrograph width analysis, you have to gather um, so as, as many as, as you can, the largest hydrographs. And then the next, the next step is to, to bring them together, standardize them with the peak flow of each hydrograph, which means you just divide the peak flow of that hydrograph to its peak, and it will be so that the peak flow is at one and then that one is converted to percentage. So the peak flow is at 100%. And the peak flow is set at time zero. 
So the rising part of the hydrograph is on the negative time side, and the uh, receding part of the hydrograph is on the um, positive uh, time. Then the next step is at each percentage is indicated, um, the widths were determined on both sides, on the rising side, on the left side of the peak, and also on the right side of the peak. So the widths of each hydrograph was determined at that percent of the peak, and then the median was calculated. Um, so you have mediums of hydrograph at several percentages of the peak. And then the next is to join the points. Once you have calculated the medians at each percentage, so that is the median of those hydrographs at that percentage, the median of those hydrographs at that percentage, it is on those sides of the peak, and then you just connect those points, and you will end up with a median hydrograph. You do this at a, at a gauged station based on observed uh, hydrographs. That's how the median hydrograph is generated at a gauged location. However, uh, you might come across, well, this will be the end. You see, those points are the median points. The, those points are connected together, and that hydrograph is created, the median hydrograph. That will, may not be the case all the time. You might come across um, hydrographs like that. You would have kinks at the, at the bottom side of the hydrograph, or hydrographs like that. The hydrograph with analysis software within the FSU uh, web portal would smooth it out for you using um, a couple of probability distribution curves, which I will mention uh, in the next slides. Um, when the median hydrograph was driven for the whole country, then the next step was to find a best probability distribution to fit into those medians. And it was found that two, they have to use a combination of two probability distributions. The first one was gamma curve, and the, the second one was exponential curve. Um, and those probability distributions, they have their own parameters. The gamma, gamma curve has n, which is the shape, par the shape parameter, and tr, the translation or the location parameter. And the exponential uh, recession curve has one parameter, and it's called the recession parameter. Um, that's what it looks like. The gamma curve, sorry, um, back again. Um, that's the gamma curve. It goes on the rising side of the hydrograph up to the peak and then up to the inflection point. If you just use the whole way a gamma curve, the hydrograph would look like, like that. It will be steeper on the recession side. So it was, no, it was not fitting well. So another curve was needed to fit after that point, and that was the exponential decay curve. So there are a combination of two distribution curves used to generate hydrograph at gated locations in Ireland. Um, then that's at gated location, but you need it also to generate a hydrograph shape at ungaged location where you, where you don't have observed hydrographs. In the observed, in the gauge location, so where there is observed hydrograph, and you have gamma curve and exponential curve, and you have those parameters, you can effectively calculate from the observed gauge hydrographs the value of n, t, r, and c. So, which means you have a gauge value for n, t, r, and c. You can determine that using the, the, the curves in terms of time and peak flow. B then 
once you have that measured values for the parameters, in order to, to generate them at engaged location, a relation was created. A regression analysis was carried out. So that, that those type of equations were created to find out the value of n, which means um, the value of n using that equation was nearly the same to the value of n you get from the observed hydrograph. So once you, you have that relation created for those parameters, you can create backwards a hydrograph shape at engaged locations, at engaged, which means you just use those physical catchment descriptors to create those parameters, and with those parameters, you can draw your gamma curve and exponential curve, which means you will have a hydrograph shape at engaged location. But again, um, you have to, you want it as, as we did when we were calculating the QMED, you, ha you have to be, it makes sense, you have to use a pivotal site so that your estimation is within reasonable, um, uh, con uh, within reasonable value. So what the module does is it suggests a, a typical similar pivotal site based on base flow, farl, and slope. Then you do the adjustments in the same way it was done when we calculated the median flow, the QMED, and that's transferred to your subject site. So this is an example. Um, hydrograph shape generated using PCDs and also gauged. Um, so in order to have your hydrograph shape at engaged locations, first you have to select a pivotal site with similar, hydrologically similar, and then you do your adjustments, and then we will show you later how it's done using the FSU web portal. Um, the F FSU will give you a number of candidate stations uh, as pivotal um, stations from where you are trans you are adjusting um, your subject site, the hydrograph shape, which will be uh, generated for the subject site. So th there are a number of hydrographs in that gauging site. You would you have to adjust that is the the blue hydrograph you see is from a PCD, and then you have to adjust that blue hydrograph so that it is representative of the all observed hydrographs at the pivotal site. And then that magnitude of this adjustment is uh, recorded at, at in the web portal. And um, there is also a, f a facility within the web portal to adjust um, the hydrograph shape. This is uh, an example of an original and adjusted hydrograph shape for the subject site indicated. So um, the adjustment you made at the pivotal site is transferred to the subject site to, to, re to reflect the behavior of the pivotal site at the subject site. The assumption is, as I said earlier, they behave hydrologically the same. Well, finally, um, you will have a hydrograph generated uh, for your subject site and for different re return periods. Um, you have five-year return period hydrograph, 10-year, 100-year, and up to 200 years. Um, as you can see at, in, at the plot on the far side, it, it, it is still in percentages with the peak set at zero, but uh, the web portal will give you the X and Y value in, in time and also uh, the magnitude of um, design flows. So you can export that data, for example, into Excel and uh, do your hydrograph uh, manipulation. So that will be um, 
your final output from the FSU web portal hydrograph generation. So what happened is, just to sum up, um, observed hydrographs were gathered and lumped together. A median hydrograph weeds was calculated at percentages on those sides of the peak. And then those median values were connected. So a, a median hydrograph was created. So to model that hydrograph shape, a combination of two probability distribution were fit. So we have gamma curve and exponential decay. So that is done at a gauged station. And then the probability distributions, they have their own parameters. The parameters were calculated from the observed hydrographs. So we effectively, you have observed value of the NTR and C. And then for those parameters, a relation was created between the observed value of those parameters and physical catchment descriptors. So there was an regression analysis done. So we, we, we ended up with equations, three different equations. Then using those equations, you can drive hydrograph shape at engaged location. Then what, uh, that's the, the logic, the methodology behind the hydrograph shape analysis. And then in order to drive a hydrograph shape at engaged site, the web site, the web portal will suggest to you um, candidate potential p pivotal sites from where you can transfer the hydrograph shape behavior into your sub subject site, into your site of interest. And then at the end, um, the web portal will generate a hydrograph shape for the for several return periods, which would be part of your report or an input into your hydraulic modeling. Thanks. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is actually go into the portal and just show you how you would actually create a hydrograph for an ungaged location. Now we'll continue with where we were, actually go on to the hydrograph widths. Okay, we've got to the point where we've got our design flows, which is basically design peak flow. Now, for different applications and mostly for hydraulic modeling, you're gonna need a hydrograph as an input to a hydraulic model. So this is the module in which you actually create that hydrograph. So you can see, in a similar way again, the portal will move you automatically. I just wanna make sure that this is yeah, that's okay, that's gone on. Um, so obviously the subject site is, is the one we picked earlier this morning. <coughs> so straight away the portal will suggest to you a possible hydrograph pivotal site. So once again, similar to the QMED estimation, for QMED estimation, you have your subject site already. What you do then is you look for a pivotal site, a site that's hydrologically similar or behaves in a similar manner. Um, and in a similar way, that's what we do with the hydrograph. You have your subject site, but now what we do is we pick a, a pivotal site or a hydrograph pivotal site that behaves in a similar fashion from the point of view of constructing hydrographs now this time around. So you can see again, like uh, previously for the QMED stuff, it gives you lots of different suggestions for what your pivotal sites would be. Okay, so there's a big list there. What you can do is, you can go in and look at the hydrograph shapes for all of these suggested pivotal sites. So you can see the portal is just going around the country looking for all these similar ones. Now what you can see here is that there is a sort of clustering of all the hydrologically similar sites, seems to cluster, in, you know, generally the same way here, where they all, um, they start rising from about the minus 25 hour mark, falling down to around about the 60 hour mark. Um, there's one or two outliers here, now what you can do within this portal, and I probably didn't explain it earlier, is you can see there this blue, these two blue ones seem to be outliers, 36015. So what you can do is you can go down to the legend and find that one, switch it off. This other one, pretty much an outlier, 29007 in Cropwell, you can switch that off as well. So what this is doing here is the portal is showing you all of the 
uh, hydrographs of all the gauging catchments that behave, behave in a hydrologically similar fashion. Can I just ask you a question there? Yep. True, but on balance, it looks like most of these hydrologically similar ones do tend to cluster in the same area. Yeah, I, I would agree that there is a possibility it could be the outliers that are the, the exception to the rule or the correct one. But um, from this point of view, uh, we would be saying that... Now, I'm only just showing this now. I'm saying these are outliers just to show how you can remove them. But uh, yeah, if you were doing a site-specific study, you would be saying, well, it's like everything with your QMED and picking your pivotal sites there. You have to justify why you're getting rid of them. So yeah, no, very true. They could be right. Um, but you would have to justify why you're picking one or the other. But yeah, it, it is quite possible that all these other ones could be wrong. But this is just, as I say, it's another one of these visual aids that will help you to kind of sort of home in on, on what may be. It's, it's just to give you an idea of what might be there before you go into it. So um, yeah, as I say, you can actually delete off a lot of these so you can go and look at the specific sites. And you can bring it back to the point where you're, where you're left with your own hydrograph shape that you get from catchment descriptors at the ungauged location, so you can see it there. So that's what the unadjusted hydrograph looks like if you just use those N, T, R, and C equations. So that's what you would get. But yeah, you can switch all the other ones on just to see, because these, as I say, we've said that these are hydrologically similar. Now, we only use three catchment descriptors to define hydrological similarity in this regard. So there may be other catchment descriptors that, that play a part in actually defining what's hydrologically similar. But as I say, that's just a visual aid to set it show just to uh, give you an idea of, 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 of the uh, shapes for the other um, catchments that are in, uh, hydrologically similar. Okay, so we've, um, just say for example that we take this pivotal site here. So we've looked at the hydrograph shapes and we're happy enough maybe for example that 34009 is the one we want to run with. So we click OK and say that's selected as our pivotal site. What the portal will do is it'll show you the hydrograph shape of your pivotal site. Now we're into the stage now where we're looking at the pivotal site. In a similar fashion to what we did with QMED, you look at the pivotal site first and then what you do is you adjust your uh, equation, the estimates you get from your equation. You adjust that to suit what's at the gauge. And then that gives you an adjustment. That's a, a degree or a magnitude of your adjustment. And then you apply that to your subject site. So that's what we're going to do here. So you start off initially here, it shows you the hydrograph shape of your pivotal site. And just as another one of these visual aids, we just pick, or the portal will pick the largest hydrograph on record and just show it, just to give a bit of context, really. Um, now, as I say, all these hydrographs will probably vary, but what you're looking at is something that's representative of that catchment. So um, we've decided to go with this. Uh, so we'll say it's hydrologically similar. Um, there might be other reasons why we're saying it's similar. Maybe, for example, we've looked at a lot of the catchment descriptors for it and found that it's a similar slope. Um, no lakes, similar to our subject site. You type in your reasons there, like you've, you've done before, and you accept it. So what it does next is, it shows, it picks the top 10 hydrographs at your pivotal site. Now some of these are quite varying, so you'll see there's a, a variation in, in, in hydrographs here. It all depends a lot of the time on the rainfall regime that's happening at the time of these events. But if you get enough of these, you can get a, f a, a, a sort of a feel for what the overall hydrograph shape would be at that site, or the representative hydrograph shape. And these plots here, they've shown um, a window uh, before and after the peak. So it shows your window here is 48 hours before the peak and 72 hours after the peak. Now, some of these, you want to isolate it out. So what you can do is, uh, in this example, I try 48. Yeah. You can isolate them out, so you can, you're just looking at individual um, events then. So just say you're happy enough that they, you've got the right window, this will be what you use then in the next step to look at all of the uh, hydrographs at that site you proceed. 
Okay, the next step is you inspect the hydrograph at your pivotal site. So you can see now, this is probably not a great example. There's a good bit of variation on it. But what you can see is at your pivotal site, um, rather than run over those, um, you try and find, you know, probably something that approaches a median for a lot of these. Um, in this example, you probably want to narrow the, the falling arm a little bit. So you can do that by adjusting up to, to wherever we'll say. So you can see you can make adjustments to the size of the um, hydrograph. You can stretch the whole lot. Or, as I say, you can stretch the, um, the rising arm of it and regenerate. Just to have a look at it again. So, um, yeah, th this is very subjective, I must add. Um, depending on what you're looking for, uh, it would be definitely an engineering judgment uh, call here. Um, but I would say, I'm, I'm, I'm just say, for example, I'm picking a, a slightly narrower hydrograph than, than what seems to be suggested. So um, I'll accept that and move on. Just takes to show you how this adjustment is showing up. <coughs> so this is what you get. This is your before and after, effectively. So this is the original shape. This blue is what we got from the catchment descriptors for our subject site. Then what we did was we adjusted the pivotal site and looked at the degree of adjustment at the pivotal site. So you can see the before and after figures here and below. And once you've done that, once you've made your adjustment at the pivotal site, that gets transferred onto your subject site hydrograph that you got from your catchment descriptors. So you can see here that um, in this example, I've made it narrower. So uh, the blue is what we had originally. After you perform the adjustment from the pivotal site, you get this the black hydrograph there. So it's, it's actually narrower. So that's the adjustment applied at your subject site. So you can select different types. If you believe that what you got from your catchment descriptors originally was probably better than, than, um, than anything else, you can use the unadjusted estimate or you can use your custom, adjust, uh, custom deformation factor either. But uh, in this example, we're happy enough with it, so we'll go with the adjusted estimate. And you accept. So that's saying, saying that your hydrograph is now completed. So what it does is it's already got your peak flows from the different return periods. So it plots the hydrograph for those. So for all these different return periods, so if you click on the 100, you can see there it's giving you your hydrograph there <coughs> uh, with a peak of 100. Now, as uh, Faisal was saying, in your flood estimation report at the end, it will show the actual peaks of these. But in tabular format, they're all here anyway. So you can see the peak for each return period is at zero. So the 100-year return period flow was 243.47. And they're effectively, they're just the coordinates, the xy coordinates. Um, for the hydrographs at this site for each return period. Now you can copy those out, paste them into a Excel sheet and play around with them or whatever purposes you would have. Um, but that's, that's your output hydrographs there. That's where you're finished effectively. So that's the hydrograph shape, how you construct your hydrograph. Now there's a further module, the, the last module in the whole portal and it's called IBIDEM. And I'll just explain what that is. Once again, you're just recording that you're finished with your, your hydrograph shape. So you click on OK. You're automatically brought into IBIDEM then. Um, actually, just another thing. I showed you there you could copy and paste out the coordinates for the hydrographs. You can also export them here if you need to. That will export them into a CSV and you can save them. But what we've what we found after doing some public consultation maybe four or five years ago, um, when we suggested to people that the way you create hydrographs was going to use absolutely no rainfall inputs. People found it a little bit difficult because they were so used to using the older flood studies report design event method. Um, I can't say I know an awful lot about it myself, to be honest, but um, they were used to using the older method that used rainfall inputs. So what we came up with here was effectively something to sort of bridge that gap. Um, and it's really just, I, I suppose, people won't use this in their day-to-day -day work, but a lot of people will use it maybe for comparing backwards to what they would have got if they were using the older flood studies report. 
Um, I would caution when using this, they are, it's like comparing apples and oranges. They're not exactly the same thing. They're calculated differently, so you will get differences. But yeah, effectively, this is what it is. It's a curve-fitting piece of software. What it does is it takes the hydrograph that you've produced using the flood studies update methods. <coughs> it takes the values for the time to peak and the standard percentage runoff that you would use if you're um, involving um, a flood studies report method. And what it does then is it tweaks the time to peak and the standard percentage runoff until it gets the best fit to your FSU hydrograph. And when it, once it has done that, it reports back all of the variables that it used to calculate that TP and SPR that gave you the, the best fit. So you can see what's been already brought in from catchment descriptors are things like the area, the SAR, the urban extent. Um, you can also define what the threshold you're going to use for fitting your flow. So you can make it higher or lower, depending on what you want. The base flow will be calculated automatically. And then it asks you if you want to use the module three hydrograph. So yeah, we're going to use the hydrographs that we produced already. And we're going to compare um, how the flood studies, what basically what answers the flood studies report method would give to produce the same shape as we've done in the flood studies update. Now what you need to do here firstly is to provide your input file as such. And um, just to show you what it is, it's a sample rainfall file. That's what, that's what goes in there. This is one for another location. So you can see what you produce is along the left-hand side there, you've got all your different durations. Along the top, you've got your return periods. And in this table here, you've got all your different rainfall depths. So that'll look for the, the different uh, critical durations when it's actually doing the rainfall run or the FSR method. OK. So what you have to do is you have to input a rainfall file. So we've already prepared one for this. And you process it. Now what this does is it takes your, as I say, it takes your FSU hydrographs and then it starts trying to curve fit TP and SPR until it matches as well as possible. Now it takes a few seconds to do that. Yeah, hopefully it's still working anyway. But um, yeah, what you're going to see now in a minute is effectively the two curves shown on top of each other. One is for the FSU, one is for the FSR method. So yeah, you can see here what it has done is it has tried as far as possible to fit an FSR hydrograph onto the flood studies update hydrograph. And then it reports back about the, the factors and the figures that you would have to put into an FSR hydrograph to be able to get something that's similar to the FSU. Um, as I say, it's something that people can use to compare and contrast, but um, as I said, treat it with caution because it, it, they are not using the same methodologies. There's a lot of differences between the two, so treat it as just a blind curve fitting exercise. I'd say if 1% of the people in the audience use this, I would be um, happy enough. <laughs> but I don't think most people will ever use this, but it's still good just to show it to you um, and, and what it does. Um, also, what you do is when you're finished there, if you want to include it in your flood estimation report, some people may or may not, you can actually click on the button there to include it in your final report. Okay, so um, so that's it. Really, at this stage now, you've gotten to the end of, of all your tabs. You're at the very end of the whole, the whole process. So where we move on to next, really, is how do you get your flood estimation report? How do you actually produce your report? So what you would be doing here is, like Fasoon probably explained earlier, you have to, well, save it. So you've saved everything up to that point. Then you can't just go directly and actually produce your flood estimation report. You have to go and lock it in or finalize it, as I prefer to say. So once again, you'll be asked to record that decision. So yes, I'm going to actually finalize it. Okay, so that should be finalized now. Right, so um, everything is done, you've finalized it. So then what you do is you go and you actually produce your report. So now, 
You can see down at the bottom here, it shows up all of the reports that I have finalised. So these are all the uh, analyses that we've done in the past. So you can see the session names of them. Uh, the last one here being the one that was done today, 10th of the 12th, completed at 17... Oh, uh, we're working on Dutch time there. Uh, that's where it was actually done. But um, that was the last one that was done today. So that was the one we're just after completing. So if you want to look at your report, you click on the download button. So what the portal does now is it goes back, goes through all of the decisions you made, goes back, collects up all of the information and the outputs that you um, produced along the way through all the different modules. And this usually takes a few seconds, but what eventually happens is it'll pop up that there is um, a PDF file <coughs> created and it gives you all of the information. So this is it. And this is what you get. Um, you'll get your flood estimation report for the Munster Blackwater. So the session name, so whatever name you've given it will be here. It tells you when it was generated, um, which is actually correct now. Um, so there's your subject site. It gives you all the information about your subject site when you were doing your QMED calculations. It also gives you the information about the pivotal site for your QMED estimation and all of the different catchment descriptors that relate to it. Also, the number of AMAX series, number of years, all, all that kind of information is there. And then after that, it shows you a map of the location of your subject site, which is here. And just to give it a bit of context, it'll show the hydrometric area from which it came, um, just to, I suppose, just to give an idea of, of where it sits within, it, within the hydrometric area. Also, there's the AMAX series for your pivotal site. And more importantly, it gives you your QMED estimates that uh, you use to get your final result here. Then, once you have got your QMED, we moved on. Uh, you'll remember to doing a, a pooling group or pooled analysis. So it gives you the details of your pooling group there again. And then the final growth curve that was derived at the end of it all. And it gives the ordinates, co or rather coordinates, for your growth curve as well. I'll just pan down to this. It's a bit ugly looking. And then it shows you what growth, facts were, growth factors were finally adopted. Um, so it gives you a return period of your peak flows all in the one table. Um, so once you had your growth factors done, we moved on to the hydrograph width estimation. So same story again, it gives you your pivotal site, gives you your deformation factors that you finished up with, and then it gives you the plots for the hydrographs, and it gives you the coordinates for each of the hydrographs, for each return period you'll see here. That's the 10 year return period hydrograph, and all of its coordinates. So it gives you for everything up to the 200 year hydrograph. And then it gives you the IBIDEM plots and the IBIDEM tables as well at the end. So it gives you all of your information that was required to produce the flood studies report <coughs> version of the hydrograph, your SPR and your PR and your time to peak for each of the return period hydrographs. I think that's nearly the end of it. Yeah. Also, something that's included at the end of your flood estimation report is this audit trail report. Um, as you were going through the whole process, you had to make decisions at each point. So this is where the decisions that you made were recorded. So I suppose in a lot of situations, maybe some consultants might use this to kind of um, look at the behavior or look at how people are carrying out their calculations uh, for their own reasons. I don't know, maybe just to kind of gauge how people are using this, if everyone's using it differently or if they're using it the same way. But it, it, as I say, yeah, it'll show all your decisions here uh, that you adopted the latest HW8 hydrograph when it was when that decision was made, what you did, what adjustments you made. All of that kind of information is there. So that's the flood estimation report. So I'll just come out of that. <coughs> now, something else that I would like to show you as well is some of the other, I suppose, features that are within the portal. So I'll just move into this. We've used up 
all of our tabs in the rainfall and flood estimation applications um, uh, tab or button there. What we haven't shown you yet was the download module. Everything that we've used in the flood studies update research, be it the flow data sets or the spatial data sets <coughs> that were developed, we put them up here. So you can download them for your own research if you want. And I was saying to somebody at the break there, um, we have more catchment descriptors than just the eight or so that I showed you. We have a lot of other catchment descriptors that at the start of the research we developed, I think, nearly 21 or 22 catchment descriptors. And then as the research followed on, some of them dropped out as being not really useful for flood estimation. Some of them were found to be more important. But there are other catchment descriptors there for all these 134,000 points. And while we may not have used them for flood estimation purposes, we have seen some examples recently where people have used them for other purposes, the other catchment descriptors that are there. Um, uh, one example was somebody, I think it was Irish Inland Fisheries Ireland, took some of the other catchment descriptors and used it to develop expressions for stream power in the Liffey catchment because they were studying lamprey habitats. So they were able to actually set out locations where the stream power was maybe weak enough to allow lamprey to, to live in or do whatever they do there. Um, so yeah, th there are other reasons and other purposes that you can use this data for. So we've um, said we just put everything that we have and we put it up here. So if you wanted to actually download some of the data that we have, you can click on this button here, new download request. And it'll give you a load of different types of data source. So the first and most obvious probably is the annual maximum series. Then there's the continuous flow time series, the every 15 minutes the, that flow series. Also spatial layers, so some of the catchment outlines, some of the, the physical catchment descriptors, the node points, their XY coordinates and all the catchment descriptors that go with them, you can get them in these spatial layers and the spatial layer attributes as well. Um, I'll just show you an example for the annual maximum. So just say we want to download an annual maximum for one of the gauging stations. You click on the type or the data source, and then you have the list of all the FSU stations there. So if you wanted to download the data for that station, you'd send a request. What it does is it goes off to find it, um, and then it should show up here in a few seconds as a little green arrow that you can download and open up that CSV file. One thing I will show you, or say to you as well, the data that was used in the FSU because of the sort of lead-in time for the research, it was a good six or seven years, a lot of the data you will find here is up to 2004 or 2005. So, so yeah, if you're looking for the most up-to-date AMAC series, I would say this is not exactly the place to go. I would be saying consult with the likes of the EPA hydrometric section or the OPW hydrometric section, or I think the ESB also have a hydrometric section as well. Um, there are lots, lots of different organisations do. So, yeah, this stuff is just what was used in the research. It's not the current data. Um, we will hopefully update this in about another two or three years to include some of the more recent uh, flood inf information. But that's just to give you an idea. Um, once again, new data, new download request, uh, continuous, no, I'll go into the spatial layers. You can also download GIS layers, download GIS layers, so the gauged catchments outlines, uh, the ungauged catchment outlines. That's a fairly big file now. That's all the ungauged catchments in the whole country. Um, the lakes, the rivers, the hydrometric areas, cities, towns. More importantly, down towards the end here, the ungauged locations. That's the all of those node points around the country. So you can download that and bring it into your own GIS. Um, and then you can do you know further analysis with them. But they, that will contain all the catchment descriptors for the for those node points that you would have seen earlier. So um, that is the data download. Now also, um, in the home page, you do have your documents here. They're in a nice, tidy format. Um, so you can download all of the research work packages. They've been summarized into these technical research reports. And then there's further documentation. But I'll just take you back to that, our download. The documents are also there. So you can download them from here either. Um, so all of the documents that are in that uh, documents page on the home page can be found here also. 
but the only extra or the extra information you can get from here is also the software. So any software that we produced uh, during the FSU re research or any that we produce in the future, we will upload here so people can use that. Um, the only one that's up there at the moment is the hydrograph width analysis software um, that was produced by NUI Galway. And okay, it does actually do an awful lot of analysis on hydrograph widths, etc. But it is able to extract lots of other information like peaks over threshold flows, um, annual maximum series. It, does, it can do a lot of different things. So it's a very useful piece of um, software. Um, you can download that. It's not built into the portal. You download that onto your own PC and use it um, in isolation. But it's a very useful piece of software uh, for lots of analysis of continuous flow time series. So um, they are the main features of the second application button there. And that's the download one, as I said before. What I want to just go back and just go into some of the other information that we do have on the FSU web portal. Um, we spoke earlier there about the, um, the uh, or Facile showed it earlier rather, the FSU guidance handbook. Um, I think in the first presentation we did back in Athlone, I neglected to show this and the feedback form showed about half the people saying it'd be great if there was a user manual. This, this is the user manual here, the FSU guidance handbook. Um, just a few seconds, yeah, it's downloading, okay. It's great to have good Wi-Fi. Um, so yeah, this is the guidance handbook. So it's, it's the how-to guide, it's the user's manual. Um, so it'll tell you everything that you need to know. So anything that we've gone through here, you can find it in, in a text format. Um, like everything, we've a, a good long disclaimer just to make sure that everybody's covered. Um, it'll explain the different applications then it goes into how to use it. And it does give information about the preferred browsers, the type of um, process, processor that you have on your PC. One thing I would say is um, we have found that Google Chrome and Mozilla Firefox are the most stable and most suitable um, uh, browsers for, for the portal. Uh, we found a few kind of quirks with Internet Explorer. So um, I suppose we couldn't cover every single browser, but these two are the preferred to Google Chrome and Mozilla Firefox. So just to keep that in mind, if you do find that you're having some difficulty with some of the um, growth uh, curves towards the end and they're not plotting well or they're plotting a little awkwardly, it's something to do more so with the browser. So maybe just go back and look at that. Um, it does pretty much everything we've done in, our, in these presentations. It explains all the different sort of parts, the homepage, but then it goes on. And um, if I can find it, yeah. yeah shows you how to use the data download. I, 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 don't, I don't think I need to explain enough lot more. It, it just basically tells you how to do everything, really. So it'll tell you how to use the modules, what buttons to press, to go. Um, there's other features that I may not have covered today. You'll be able to find them there. More information about how you upload your own information, your upload your own uh, Pivotal sites, things like that. So that is the user manual. Now, what I would also like to show you as well on the homepage, we have links to other FSU websites, or OPW websites, rather. So seeing as I'm here, I might as well give a blatant plug to some of the other websites. Um, the, I suppose the one that most of you here would use in conjunction with the FSU web portal, if you're doing some sort of a flood study, would be the floodmaps.ie. Um, I'll just show it to you quickly for those of you who would not be familiar with it. I think most of you might be, but there may be a few who haven't used this or seen it before. Um, what the Fl National Flood Hazard Mapping website is, it's, um, it's a database of all the previous uh, recorded floods. It's not predictive flooding, it's floods that have been reported in the past, that have a local authority report associated with them, they may have a news report associated with them, or some other information. And that's all available here. Um, I'll take we we'll presume that Dublin is a town. Let's see. Dublin. Uh, Dundrum, see if there's anything there. Um, let me just go. Okay, so you can see there it shows all of the previous flood events. Now these could go back over 100 years, so um, 
going to get too worried to think that this is a real hot spot here, but these are all the documented reports. Now, they could vary back from years previous to when uh, flood alleviation works were done or if some sort of flood defences were put in, but you can get all the information that you want there. <coughs> so you can get the reports that are associated with it. And very often these would be local authority reports where local area engineers have gone out, or in this case the EPA have done assessment of flooding based on something that happened in the past. So lots of reports there, some of it is mapped as well. So that's a very important resource that if you're looking at a certain area, you can see if there is a flood history there. Yeah, I'll just go back down a bit. Also something that we've found a lot of people are using, especially canoeists recently, um, is the real-time water level, waterlevel.ie website. This contains the real-time water level at 426 stations. I think they're adding a few to it, but I think they're, they're near the ceiling there. There's about 426 operational stations around the country with telemetry that report back uh, the water levels every, I think is it roughly every hour or so. <coughs> so you can basically use the filter here to search for a gauging station number or, na or name. But also something that we found useful, if you're looking at post-flood events, and you want to get data or information about the hydrograph from, say, a flood event that happened maybe two weeks ago down in the southeast or something similar to that, you can click on your station groups. So you can pick a catchment, for example, the Slaney, and it'll show you all of the flood events that have happened, or rather the levels going back five weeks. So you can see here, some of these are tidal, so that's why you get that sort of scribbly sort of effect. But yeah, you can see back in um, Enniscorty, the level on the staff gauge was 3.66 on the 14th of the 11th, 2014. Mm -hmm. So the 14th, yeah, it was a Friday evening, I think it was. Um, uh, the 14th is when a lot of the flooding happened around Enniscorty. So you can see there it's historical data. So sometimes you can use this maybe if you are looking at flood estimation to put it in context. You know, this is what we're... Uh, this is our, what our design gives us. This one was you know, registered as being the third biggest re on record. This is where our design flood has come in relation to this. So it's good to give context sometimes to some of your flood estimations as well. And like I said before, uh, we've heard that a lot of canoeists are using that just to see when the conditions are right to go out on some of the rivers. Okay, I think we're really nearly at the end of it now, but um, what I might do is just draw your attention to something that you'll see. You might notice on the portal we've got the help desk up here. So if you have any queries, you can go into the help desk through there. Your uh, email address, everything is automatically put in so you can type your message in. This can be feedback, which we would greatly appreciate, or it can be just a query. <coughs> and you'll notice how much we actually want that feedback because over here, we also have contact which leads you to the help desk again. And down at the bottom, we have another button back. So if you miss the other two, you'll still get this one. So you can see, maybe we're giving you a hint here that we'd like a lot of feedback. Um, because myself and Fasil sit opposite each other and we look at each other all day. And we're thinking, what would people like? But we don't know uh, until we hear from people externally. Um, so yep, the feedback is what I would say would be one of the big messages I'd like to, to to give out here is that we'd love to get feedback because then we know what we can fix, what we can change, what people are having problems with. If people are having problems with something, we can try and come up with a fix for that. Um, what I would say is any updates to the, this, the FSU will probably be two to three years from now. The reasoning being, I suppose, number one, data sets are changing very rapidly uh, in the, I suppose, the modern era. You're getting new mapped data sets, like, for example, only about a Two or three months ago, Chagask released the Irish Soil Information System. I have the title right there, hopefully, um, which was new soil mapping for the country. Um, we weren't long after finishing this when it came out. Uh, various other data sets, like our own flow data, is constantly being updated. So that has to be brought into the next iteration of the portal. So um, I suppose we sat down and said, well, look, how often do we do it? Um, and I think we've made a decision at this point that for two to three years, we let it sit here, let it bed in, let people get used to the methodologies, the way it works, 
um, and then in two or three years' time, make a few subtle updates to it and changes. That will obviously be notified to everybody on our news page here. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll well publicise. We will publicise any changes that we are going to make. But um, yeah, just to just to kind of bring that point back, that we will be updating it again. That's why we have it in the web portal because it is amenable to updating in the future. And hopefully, based on suggestions we get from users, we may add in a few extra um, modules there that might be of use to people. Um, we want something that people can actually use. Um, another issue there, I think I'm probably leading people towards a question here. Um, the data that we have, um, just to draw attention to it, a lot of it only goes up to 2005. People will say, what about 2009? That blows everything out of the water. We have looked at the effects of some of the flow, uh, or sorry, flood events that have happened since this data was brought out. Um, and I suppose, just to reassure a lot of people, we've found that a lot of the QMED values at gauges around the country have not really changed an awful lot. I suppose mostly that's due to the fact that, okay, we did have a large value in 2009, but a lot of the were probably below your QMED value, so they, they sort of balance out as such. And we have done an analysis on, on, on the gauging stations around the country, and we found I think was it six gauging stations that had a changed, their QMED had changed by more than 5%, and three that where it had actually decreased by more than 5%, and the rest of them were somewhere in between. Over the whole country, if you were to take the QMED values, which I think it was only 0.04% was the overall increase in the QMED values as an average across the country. So um, that's why we've used QMED, I suppose, in the first place, less sensitive to some of these bigger events. Um, but yeah, we will try and update those when the time is right and as uh, well within reason as soon as we can. So um, I think we're nearly at the end. So what I might do is we're we're finished well in advance. So um, I will take questions. So again, um, we could try and limit it to one per person, and then uh, if you could say your name as well, just to, to introduce who you are and where you where you work. Uh, we will say the FSU team, we wouldn't be checking it. We have our hydrometric section in Galway. I think as a general rule, um, I think it's about once a year. Now that would all obviously depend on whether they've got out to a large event and taken spot gaugings. If they've, for example, down in the southeast there a few weeks ago, there was a lot of major flood, large flood events. So they would have got a lot of spot gaugings around about that time. Um, and based on those spot gaugings, they may or may not change their rating curve. But if, as I say, if, if they find that this sheds new light on what their rating curve should be, then they will change it. Um, it's a question I would have, you'd have to probably ask to the hydrometric section in Galway and Hedford what exactly their procedures are, what intervals they update them. But um, generally, if there's no major spot gaugings taken, um, a rating curve could stay there for years. But if there's lots of actual spot gaugings taken, it could change maybe twice a year. So it's um, yeah, it's probably more so one of their own organisational questions. More so, I'd say. Yeah, if you think that you've got what you want when you get to the point where you've maybe even just calculated your 100 year flood, you can save it, finalize it, and print your flood estimation report. And like that, it'll give you all the information again, except you won't see your hydrograph or your IBIDEM stuff. So um, yeah, if you decide that you've, or even if you, all you wanted to do is get your QMED value, you can save it and hit the finalize button, that lock button, um, and then that's it, you're done. You can print it off. Now what you could also do is, if you want to keep continuing on, you can hit your save as, save it as something else, and you can continue on the whole way with your new file. And then you can go back and finalize your initial file and just print off, say, the first half of your report. So yeah, it, it is possible to print it at different stages, um, but it would be using that, a combination of that save as option 
and your, your lock option, that's when you want to actually print it. But yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Uh, Arthur Barry from Maroc. You said the data you have is up to 2004. Mm. One of your depth and duration equations is a graph that you have. If you download it from the Met office, can you upload that in? Would you reckon that would be more recent? It's the same thing. Yeah, it's the same model. It was actually the depth duration frequency model that you see there is what Metairn use on their website. I, I don't know if people are familiar with it. You can go into the Metairn website and you can type in a, a duration and a return period and it'll spit, spit out a table for you that uses exactly the same code as what we have here because they developed it for us. So we've, to be honest with you, it's, it's one thing we're looking at is actually taking that functionality they have to be able to produce a table rather than just individual values. But um, yeah, the two are the same. Yeah. Balance there with the runoff of the the water going into the into the pond. Does that account in any way for the ever increasing attenuation that's been put in in urban areas and that kind of thing, or did your typical site balance that out then? You're you I suppose you're really into site specific things there because yeah, um, when you refer to attenuation, this would probably be more so to say planning applications where the council have asked for you to put in attenuation measures. No, it doesn't account for anything like that. They're, they're, to be honest, there are so, so many of them, it's very hard to just even just to get information on them. So no, it would be more of a larger scale on a catchment basis rather than an individual site. What you can do in a lot of cases, and I've, I've seen some people do it, is they'll take an indicative value for what attenuation may be, but no, there's, there's nothing there. And that's why that urbanization factor, you know, the power 1.482, if there is some information you have or if there's some reasoning that you can apply to it, that's what you can use to, to, to bring that in. But we've done no research on it as, as such. And I suppose if there was data on it, we probably would be able to, but I'm, I'm guessing there's not a lot of information on that yet. Um, did I see someone over here? No. No. Okay. Last call. One more. <laughs> Uh, good question. Um, that's one for Hydrometrics. That's the Hydrometrics website. Um, they do state, all right, that they, um, as far as I know, they give the staff gauge zero on those. I could be corrected on that one. Is it? Um, I could find out for you, though. Yeah, I, I couldn't answer that. I'd, I'd have to ask someone in the Hydrometrics section, but... Um, no, I could, could find that out quite easily. But um, yeah, they, I suppose maybe something to do with the fact the staff gauge zero is it tends to change, you know, depending on wh whatever happens at that gauge. So they may be able to tell you. Oh, that's that's the uh, correction. Like. I think the reason why I'm asking the question is we've got a quite a well developed series of stations for navigation purposes, for example, in the Shannon. Mm. I think they're moving towards, yeah, th th some of the gauges are still reporting to Coolbeg, but I think they're moving towards Mallon at the moment. <coughs> um, the actual, yeah, I, I think the, I'm just trying to see here, the staff, um, no, staff gauge zeros aren't there. But um, no, I could I could find out for you though. It's something I could very easily find out. Um, but I, I know if we've been, and we need to find out what the actual levels are, we would go to our own hydrometric section and say, what's the staff gauge zero for this period? And they tell us. That's the way we do it at the moment. So um, the reason why they haven't done it on the port on this website, I'm not so sure. I don't know why. It is actually, if, if you click into some of those stations, there is a correction to Malin on some of them, but not all of them. Yeah, yeah it's actually stated just here. It does give you the, what the um, correction is there. But that's, that's, I think, just average. It changes from place to place as well. Um, so, yep. Yeah.
Yeah. I, I, I would be. I would be saying definitely anything below 25 square kilometres, I, I wouldn't be using the hydrograph shape on it at all. Yeah. Um, because you'll see, for the QMED stuff, we had 216 gauging stations. Uh, for the hydrograph shape um, analysis, we only used 89 from the A1 and A2 stations. So the coverage of small catchments for the hydrograph shape is not as good as it would be for the likes of the QMED. So, yeah, I'd be saying definitely nothing less than the 25 square kilometres. And anything below that, as I say again, there's just not enough information to know whether what, what's right or what's wrong. Um, some people might choose to actually just apply that similar shape, but just for a smaller, um, smaller flows. At this moment in time, just looking at it, I don't see any problem with it, but I can't say if that's right or wrong, because we just, like I say, we just don't have enough information there for the smaller catchments yet. Um, Ronan. Ronan Payne, Irish Water again. Um, just on the guide factors and the accommodations, is there any guidance on when you should be looking at picking a fit, a fit based on the proposed system speeders? And then the other pot that was above it, in your example there, do you think it's variability to the speeders at different ratios? Or yeah, there is what's called a heterogeneity measure um, that I didn't go through. I might see, can I just get it open again here? Uh, <clears throat> I'll just see if there's an older one here. There's a heterogeneity measure, which basically what it's saying is it gives you indications about the stretches, the, the variation of the data around this, um, you know, the pooled L moment ratios. So you might be able to use that. That is one indicator. So if the smaller that measure is, the more, I suppose, compact your, um, your behavior is around that L pooled L moment. You were wondering about the one above it, the one with the straight line plots. Um, the research that was done by NUI Galway found that where you were at a gauge, that is that straight line plot is what we call the two parameter plot. The one underneath with the curves, that was the three parameter plot. What the research found was that the three parameter plot was more suited to pooled sites or pooling analysis. The one above it, the straight line curve or the straight line plots the two parameter, they were more suited to gauge locations. So at gauge locations, you're really, what the research found as well was that at a gauge location, you're really up to making a decision between an EV1 and an LN2. And then a small percentage, you might get some of them that uh, follow this LN3 distribution. I didn't show it there, but it's one of the, the lesser used ones. So at a gauge, you would use the two parameter plots, that straight line. At an ungauge location, you would be using the three parameter plots and the two distributions that are used the most there would be the GEV and the GLO. They would be 99% of your, your situations. And then there is that LN3 distribution, but that's that rarely seems to come up on the radar at all. But it was put in there just for completeness. Um, I was just speaking to someone at one of the breaks there. We probably would maybe we'd be amenable to looking at different distributions. As I say, there's only six that are supported in the FSU if you compare it to the flood estimation handbook, I think they just used the GLO, or I stand to be corrected on that one. So yeah, we've tried to give a good range of distributions that could possibly be used. But um, as I say, we're still open to maybe using or putting in a few more in the future. But um, yeah, as I say, the gauge locations, LN2 and EV1, ungauge locations, the GEV and GLO generally seem to fit the, fit the bill better. I think that's us. Um, anyway, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Um, it's great to be able to share this after the last few years, to have people ask questions. Um, we've found the last few days, um, or the last few sessions where we've done these very useful, and we've got a lot of ideas already. So um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming, and thank you very much for your input. Um, I'd just like to hand over to Michael here. Uh, he just wants to, to close the, the session. So, Oh, yeah. Actually, just remind you, um, if everyone, I don't know if everyone has got the questionnaires, but if you haven't, put up your hand and we'll get you one. Um, that's, that's, as I said before, that's what we need is feedback. So, um, but um, yeah, I'll just hand over to Michael just to close. Uh, Michael Goss, Vice Chair of the Civil Division here in Engineers Ireland. Um, 
and also with Irish water, so I feel a bit safer here today than on Talbot Street. Um, on, on behalf of the Civil Division, though, I'd like to um, thank the speakers uh, for giving this introductory lecture on the FSU methodologies and the associated web portal. I found the, the, present, or the, the lecture, the presentation was very informative, clear, and comprehensive, and obviously a lot of time and effort went into preparing this, and I'd like to uh, congratulate the speakers on, on the efforts they've put in. I'd also like to congratulate the OPW uh, for delivery of the program, uh, for managing it and resourcing it. It's obviously a massive undertaking. Uh, and they should be, uh, they sh that should be recognised. So, uh, just to close out, I'd just ask, you, or I'd like to ask you to show your pre appreciation in the usual manner to the speakers. And uh, thank you very much.